My grandmother was a very successful farmer, mm -hmm. but she always made sure that there was a seed and there was that which was food. Yeah. The seed is for the next planting season. Of course. You can't do that today with the seeds that get planted because the intellectual property to that seed, the genetics mm. are owned by foreign multinationals. It is the biggest risk because if you should have disagreements with any of the imperialist West mm. countries who own these companies, who are aware these companies that own the genetics to the seed are domiciled. Yeah. You will then, your people will starve because they will refuse to give you seed for the following uh, planting Harvest, season. Yeah. They changed the name to South 32. They pay 17 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity for their two aluminum smelters. That contract, mm. which was onerous, and causing untold financial harm on ESCOM mm. was extended by a further 10 years in the year 2021. So what did President Cyril Ramaphosa, what did Professor Malika Burumakhova, what did uh, Katima Mulelo Andre the Reiter, mm. think when they were signing, when it costs you 42 cents, in some instances, it costs you, you know, 2 rand 28 cents, and four hundred fifty-two cents, mm. and now it has gone up to eight hundred. King King David Studio podcast. The challenge of electricity is one that will probably be spoken of for many many years. It'll be documented as a huge part of the history of this country, and that's why we continue to speak to different people who speak in this particular space of energy. What went wrong? What can be done? Uh, the effect that it has in society now—it's pretty obvious. However, there are those who know a little better than we do, and maybe they'll motivate us to join the Machua DA, <laughs> amongst many other things. And today, we decided uh, to call, um, you know, someone who, 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 when I've researched this, I found him so in every space of this particular subject. Um, that that's Seppo Kadima. How are you, sir? Very well. Well, good to be here. It's um, King David Studio. I, I like uh, the name and the choice of uh, yes, yes uh, the brand. But it's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. And I hope that uh, in, at the end of the day, we might maybe say one or two things that can mm. give the people of this country hope. Yeah. But also to say, what is it that we can do? Because uh, it is evident to me that uh, there are many things that we need to do. Absolutely. And the reason I'm remarking on the title is because, you know, now and then, not all the time. Mm. Sometimes I do get to read the Bible and I get to know a king uh, in biblical times yeah. who was you know, the man of God. The prophet came and told him not the so good news, mm. uh, but the key words were very instructive. Get your house in order. Yeah. So I, I hope that I think at the, at the end of our conversation, we'll really be able to uh, have a that right message in season for the people of this country. Mm. Let us get our house in order as far as the matters of energy provision, energy security, energy availability are concerned. You know, interesting, you use, it's a metaphor I use a lot because the house is a microcosm of reality. Mm. Your tiny little house yes. with your household is generally a reflection of, of societal issues as Indeed. well. You cannot live in isolation with the realities mm. of our country. Uh, and I know you said uh, get a house in order in relation to a specific subject. However, I would ask this. Energy is a crisis. Is it in any way uh, as a result of other issues that are just plaguing our, our society, uh, like um, moral decay, amongst other things? Uh, are they connected to uh, energy? So the challenge that South Africa has with energy, could it be connected to other external factors that we, we don't mention when we speak of energy challenges? Many times we don't mention it, and there I think there are several reasons on why we don't mention it all the time. Mm. You know, I find that uh, by and large South Africans are very polite. Mm. They don't always want to tell the truth to power. So if you look at the current crisis we are in, it is a direct result of rampant corruption and looting. Mm. of public resources. There is no technical, financial, economic reason whatsoever why South Africa should be an energy poor country. Mm. We should have been having enough energy to be able to even support our neighboring countries. And that is um, 
really based on if you look back in history. You know, on the 1st of March, 2023, ESCOM is celebrating the centenary. Hmm. <laughs> it, it pains me a great deal to say that it celebrates a centenary 100 years, but actually it won't be a celebration, but it will be rather a burial. Mm. And uh, maybe we'll then from henceforth go and talk about a commemoration of what once was. Mm. Because the future of energy in South Africa, and specifically the future of electricity, has fundamentally changed. The only tragedy is that, that those that are in leadership in government at ESCOM mm. are not aware that the winds of change have are blowing in a 180-degree direction, completely opposite direction to what they thought was the case. Mm. But they are blowing at such speeds that they will not be able to really get things in order in time. Mm. But the winds of change are blowing nonetheless. So mm. that, that's really what, look back, I'll say 100 years. When uh, we talk about energy, also we must be aware that there's a difference between energy and electricity. Mm. Because electricity is a component of energy. Yes. So when we talk about ESCOM, it means we are talking about electricity. Electricity Supply Commission, mm. that's the short name for uh, ESCOM. And that when it was founded, it was founded, and the reason why it has been able to be in existence for 100 years, it was founded on, the base, on just one basic understanding, that without electricity, it is not possible to industrialize. It was founded during the time when, if you look at in terms of the geopolitics and our politics in country, um, I mean, for example, the people like General Jan Smarts were very uh, pivotal in appointing people like Dr. Hendrik van der Beel, who effectively is the man behind the industrialization strategy of South Africa, and he understood from across the Atlantic, what they were doing, that is the United States of America. Yeah. That if you, if you go back in history, let's say ESCOM is founded in 1923, 1933, that was the height of the Great Depression. The Great Depression was global, was not just in mm, America. Yes. And that is, a, it marks a time. So when you look at 1923, when we started, look at what was happening in America at the time people like Thomas Edison, John Pierre Morgan, mm -hmm. uh, Nikola, Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla, um, and, uh, There's many, there's Carnegie. You know, Carnegie. Yes. The, the work that they were doing in terms of the industrialization, mm. the bedrock of that was Power. energy security, yeah. electricity, as well iron and steel. Yes. Because without it, there's no way that America could have developed to be what it became. There wouldn't be rail, railroads. There would have been no railroads. Yeah. There would have been no uh, maritime economy to speak about. The yeah. ships crossing the Atlantic um, and many of the other developments, the agricultural sector, for example. But when FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, came to power in 1933 at the height of the Great Depression, one of the things that he spoke of, and I like the phrase that uh, you know, was used, that we... we had to develop an America, he, he foresaw, he had a vision of the United States that from coast to coast had electricity network, had uh, railroads, had water pipelines, fuel pipelines, because utilities, what was, what was the foundation mm -hmm. of that country coming out of the Great Depression and to become the largest economy that it is today. It was based on that. South Africa itself, up until recently, was the biggest economy in all of Africa, even though it's got a smaller population than the other mm. two countries, Nigeria and Egypt. Egypt. Yeah. But the reason for that, again, was because of the correct policy decisions that were taken in the 1930s, in the 1940s, mm. and even in the 1960s. And in all of those policy decisions, what was paramount in the... Uh, minds of the colonialists, the apartheid leaders, mm. was that of ensuring energy. So what did they do? They took the correct decision. First and foremost, when the Nationalist Party came to power in 1948, yeah. 
even though you know he died shortly thereafter they never fired dr hendrik van der bale hmm. but who came in with a different with a different uh, what's this um, regime well he came you remember he was with the smart regime mm-hmm. so when the smart regime lost power yeah but they, they retained him. they retained him yeah. but also they retained in total everything else that he stood for in terms of the vision that he had to the extent that they even now honored him for example Fandabel Park mm. named after him Fandabel Street which uh, goes from you know Megawatt Park mm. in Johannesburg all of those because of the vision that he had which was foundational for this economy to become what it became so even during the Fervudian era or the Stradom era mm. in 1958 1961 63 they continued in that trajectory and great things happened based on what what was happening but energy was the foundation was the bedrock of what became so between the years 1963 and 1976 the apartheid government was spending 16% of the gdp on economic infrastructure railroads roads highways mm. um the transmission line You know South Africa today has got over 33,000 kilometers of transmission grid. Hmm. This high, you know, voltage yeah. uh, towers which pilot, is everywhere. Which, which by the way, not many countries in Europe even have hmm. that type of size of voltage. Then you so what uh, some of the other things that then happened is that a lot of work was done in terms of uh, ensuring that we become energy secure. The the, the search for gas. So we saw a lot of work happening in the karoo i know a lot about this because mm. i had the misfortune in 2014 of being appointed chairman of petro sa so <laughs> i know the misfortune. it was a it was a <laughs> splendid misery yeah <laughs> um but i know the geology of this country i know the geology of this country from well not just south africa mm. but all the way up to kenya ethiopia yeah. whether you're talking up in west africa because i visited and done work there mm. so i understand what is happening even in the karoo yeah. and then the afrikaners the nationalist party government continued in terms of energy security including the uh, pelindaba pelindaba of course yes, it was done yes, during that absolutely. era as well well today if you look at pelindaba it's uh, the i think is number one or number two in terms of production of medical isotopes Wow. nuclear medicine. Oh. Um okay. it, it's uh, it's so the spending of 16% of the GDP on economic infrastructure was a correct decision by the Nationalist Party government. Mm. The Nationalist Party government that did not discard what Jan Smuts uh, stood for. The ANC came in 1994. Mm. They started to dismantle everything else that the Nationalist Party stood for no matter how good it was for the country. For example, spending 16% of the GDP on you know on economic infrastructure. Yeah. That is that is fundamental because without that you end up with a situation where economically we are today. Today we import everything else from you know a yeah. toothpick to to chicken. Absolutely. Yeah. As soon we'll be importing eggs. <laughs> T- tell me though when because the, the criticism of the apartheid government when it comes to energy was that it was creating is an infrastructure designed for the few and not for the many it was it was it was creating a, v, a vip section in a party and a party physically like an event where only the few would get the best of the best in the whites in that regard and that's why during apartheid which i'm old enough to have lived through it yes. as well mm-hmm. uh, lights were switched for no reason in the township where it wasn't called load sharing they were just we would expect it to happen so there were still doing it such that it was suitable only for for the whites and the grid was not big enough to accommodate everyone what do you say to that well it's not entirely true mm. if you look at uh, what 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 they did with that 16% of the gdp expenditure in uh, economic infrastructure mm. um we've seen as i say the result is 33000 kilometers or so of a transmission grid that now is servicing the entire country this country we've now achieved almost universal access in terms of the uh, electricity i mean escom on its own when you exclude the municipalities i think controls in excess of 
413,000 or so uh, kilometers of transmission and distribution grid. Hmm. So we've achieved universal access. If you drive to any border town, hmm. any border dorp or village in this country, before you cross to a neighboring country, that village in South Africa will be electrified. Hmm. And the, a kilometer into the neighboring country, yes. there is no electricity there in the dark. Hmm. So obviously that would not have been possible had that infrastructure indeed been developed for the very few yeah. whites that lived in the country. The rail infrastructure that we have, whereby today we are able, the ports, I mean, Deben Port is the largest container uh, terminal in, uh, in this country. And you look at how they financed it, uh, that they passed legislation to be able to ensure that it could be financed. So there was a lot of good things that they did. And to try and deny mm. that they did good things, it is being dishonest with oneself. So that maybe brings into question, well, you know, the character of the person that would That's be making, yes, making those assertions. So, but when it came to electricity, because of that keen understanding, it is for that reason that we were able to then back up the mining development. You know, South Africa is reputed for being top in the world in terms of skill, in terms of uh, technology, of deep level mining. Yeah. There are very few countries that are mining at the depths that we are safely as we do. Mm. Mm. Because of that, but just sometimes it's never fully appreciated because people maybe don't spend time to go to in, into the mine. I mean, I run mining companies. I understand what it is to uh, uh, do deep level mining. Yeah. So, for example, if you have a gold mine, I think uh, the deepest gold mine now is Dautuna, uh, just outside uh, Porsche uh near Western area. Mm. I think that mine is what it is almost four kilometers underground. Hmm. Western uh, deep level would be uh, probably, I think, the deepest. Hmm. Hmm. But it takes time because mining at depths of even 5,000 meters below surface yeah. is a very serious business. Sure. People can die. Yes. But one of the things that is never fully appreciated is that in order for you to have people and machine at 2,000 meters below surface, 3,000 yes. meters, 4,000 meters below, four that is kilometers. four kilometers below surface. Not near. You have to run a ice factory that cannot shut down even for 10 seconds. And that's power. So if you don't have electricity, it is not possible for yeah. you to go and do those things. Mm -hmm. Now, that is on the mining side, but over the last you know 10 or 15 years, we have a council for geoscience, for example, that has been, de you know, uh, starved of money mm. to be. They haven't drilled a hole, hmm. in, even though they are a council for geosciences, but they don't have the budget to go and drill a hole so that we can then develop the mines that are necessary that will continue to be the bedrock of this economy and even have electricity that will ensure that we can be able to beneficiate and process the minerals that we mine. Yeah. You know, for many years, South Africa was number one in gold producer. Yes, of course. We employ, you know, in 1985, this country, we had 785,000 people thereabout who were employed directly in the mining sector, not in the support industry. Mm. Directly going down. Going down. Digging. Digging and yeah. mining. <laughs> Today, that figure is no more than 300,000. You spoke earlier about the 16% directed at the development of an economy, yes. uh, infrastructure and all of that. What numbers do we speak of now? We are under 3%. Huh. And remember also the other, the other problem we have is we make you know, pr public pronouncements and we'll say, we're going to spend 1 trillion rand on infrastructure. Mm. That has been a mantra. That has been a song. It hasn't been. During the time of uh, President Jacob Zuma, he said, listen, we need to build economic infrastructure. Mm. We're therefore going to build a trillion, I mean, a trillion rand worth of infrastructure. Today, they are speaking still about a trillion. Now, okay, the president is telling us, this current president is telling us that he's going to spend 98 billion US dollars, depending on where the rent to the dollar mm. is. That figure will be between 1.8 and 2 trillion rand. It's still... Within the five years that he says that he's going to spend uh, that. But exactly what is the multiplier effect mm. 
if anything, they never go and speak about the multiply effect if you spend that kind of uh, money. Whereas with the apartheid era government, they could. What is forgotten many times is that we had people coming from Malawi, from Mozambique, mm -hmm. from Lesotho, from uh, Swaziland, from um, uh, where else? You know, but the neighboring yes, countries. Yes, that the, the, used to, there's even a song. A human yes, singer song absolutely. speaks of all these places. Yes, Timel. <laughs> yes, Timel. <laughs> it's for that reason. Why? Because the people had to be brought in to come and work in our mines, to go and work in this uh, many other industries. Mm. So if, if, you, if you take that into account, and also in the rural villages, whether you go to Eastern Cape, whether the former Siskai and Transkai, mm. the people who today... Some of them, you know, live here in Johannesburg. Mm. In the Caltin Because Caltin yeah. yeah. even going to the Rustenburg area, yeah. you know, Velcom and all of those yeah. places was because those people were brought in from there. But the road network, the electrification network, the rail network, those were built by people who were also expatriates would be the correct way. <laughs> the experts instead of from saying, other countries. Instead, instead, of, instead migrant. of saying, they, they will say a migrant yeah. or uh, I, I like the way in Limpopo, I think they will say Makarapa. Oh, yeah. Instead of being, being called Makarapa. What a national. Yeah. Yeah. So, but you find that people will come from what the Bantu stands, where the apartheid era government will go and recruit from the various chiefs. Mm. Whether you call them puppets or whatever, they had subjects under them. They will go and recruit those guys to come and work in the construction sector. How do people imagine that the city of Johannesburg, the city was of Tawane, was built yeah. by who? Was built by so there was that uh, mix of, let's say, you know, bringing in people to come and do different things yeah. to build the economy, and that's where the sixteen percent of the GDP went to. Mm. But that created jobs. That had a multiplier effect. There were a whole host of other new industries that sprang up mm. as a direct result of these uh, core activities. So what we failed to do. And what this government has failed to do in many instances was to really prioritize five key things. Mm. You know, if you do five, not to have 10 or 15 or 20, mm. five. In, you say, in, in, in your term as a president. Yes, you say, yes. these are the five major things I'm going to do. Because if I do these things, the rest will fall in place. That's true. And if they had that approach, we would not have been in the problem which we're in. If they had said, ESCOM is too important, let us stick to the knitting. Mm. South Africa perfected the burning of coal to produce electricity and perfected it to such an extent that you have a power station called Matimba, mm. which is an air-cooled power station using minimal water because South Africa is an arid country. Mm. So when you talk about the advancement and the technological breakthroughs, we are pioneers as a country. The same way, even the conversion of coal into liquid fuels, yeah. jet fuel, gasoline, uh, or petrol, uh, diesel, mm. uh, liquid petroleum gas, tar, a whole host of... That Sasol, the company, mm. produces over 152 different products from a lump of coal <laughs> in a country which is replete, is rich in coal reserves in coal resources. So beyond just, let's say, having a very low yield, mm. because every lump of coal that you burn to produce electricity, your efficiency with the older technology that we have will be 33%. Mm. Now you can go to 44% with because the new technology. Because you can do more with, with yes. just that lump. But when you now take that lump of coal, you say, let me gasify it and liquefy it. Mm and then make these petrochemicals, make the liquid fuels, synthetic fuels, marvelous things happen to your economy. Uh, and that's what we should have done. Now, what Have we that... stopped doing that? Have we stopped uh, extracting more value from... from we coal? have stopped. Project Mafuta, for example. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think Trevor Manuel, one day he has to answer this to the nation on his role in uh, ensuring that Sasol obviated a windfall tax and at the same time stopped Project Mafuta in Lepalale, in Limpopo. What was Project Mafuta meant to was a, 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 a Sasol Secunda 2, if I can okay. put it that way. You okay. know, in Secunda, you've got uh, this massive uh, refinery mm -hmm. at 183,000 barrels a day. Huh. 
So the the plan was to have a similar, I think at about 250 or 300,000 barrels a day uh, in Lepalale from the coal reserves that are there. Because remember, 40% of South Africa's coal reserves are in what is called the Waterbeck mm -hmm. coal field, where Lepalale is and you know, the surrounding areas. So that is what we should have done. But that we should have done because in 1977, the Nationalist Party government promulgated a law called Central Energy Fund Act. Mm -hmm. They amended that law last in 1985. Yeah. I can tell you now, I've yet to hear the current minister, the, mm -hmm. his uh, predecessors, having ever once spoke about the Central Energy Fund Act and its importance in ensuring that South Africa, we become, we achieve energy security. Because energy security, it is sovereignty. Mm. If you don't have energy security, you are not a sovereign state. And this was confirmed by none other than the U.S. politician Henry, Henry Kissinger. Because Henry Kissinger said, and this speaks to the, um, the, 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 the geopolitical views of the Americans, mm. the, some people might say the imperialist America. Chairman Mao Zedong, of course, he made that accusation on several occasions. And I think maybe uh, President Vladimir Putin of Russia might uh, be continuing the same way. But what Henry Kissinger said is very important. Mm. We must never miss it. Because Henry Kissinger said, if you want to control a country, control energy. Mm. If you want to control a people, control food. Yeah. We can talk one day about food. I know today we are talking about the, the conversation is likely to go the same way. We have food insecurity. Yeah. Because we no longer control the intellectual property on the seed that we plant into the ground. So our farmers, mm. as they are dwindling population of farmers, on the other hand is that they don't have, the, we no longer have indigenous seeds. Let me give you an example. You can see a field of corn or a field of wheat or mm. a field of anything. You harvest it in the olden days. Mm. The seed. My grandmother was a very successful farmer, mm. but she always made sure that there was a seed and there was that which was food. Yeah. The seed is for the next planting season. Of course. You can't do that today with the seeds that get planted because the intellectual property to that seed, the genetics, Mm. are owned by foreign multinationals, the likes of Monsanto Bayer, the likes of uh, you know, Louis Dreyfus, and all of those guys, you see Pana, Pioneer, mm. and all of those guys that they advertise, but they own the genetics, including even a tomato or any of that. If you don't buy it from them, this foreign, mm, this foreign but as a country, it is the biggest risk because if you should have disagreements with any of the imperialist West mm. countries who own these companies who, or where these companies that own the genetics to the seed are domiciled, yeah. you will then, your people will starve because they will refuse to give you seed for the following uh, planting Harvest, season. Yes. And then, on the other hand, we don't have access to inputs such as fertilizer sure. because we've shut down our refineries. So when you talk about energy, it's not just about energy, from a perspective of say, well, let me go to a garage and get gasolina. Let me sweep on a light, light and yeah. then the light is on. No, there's a whole host of other byproducts mm -hmm. as a result of energy that are very critical. Alumina, for example, and, 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 and sulfuric acid, processing of minerals, purification of water, mm. which is what you need. If you don't purify the water, well, it's how exactly are you going to yes. be able to have an economic activity, particularly when you are an arid country as we are? Uh, a whole host of other inputs, as I say, that are linked directly to energy. But on the issue of food security, what Henry Kissinger prophesied, that you want to control a people, control oh, food, food, that has been achieved. The last battle is now to control energy mm -hmm. so that this country can be controlled. So all our problems are uh, emanating from that quest to control this country, mm -hmm. for us to lose our sovereignty so that we become one of the puppet states. And I am afraid we are already at the door of the proverbial Hotel California 
where you can only check in, you mm -hmm. can't you check can out. Check Once out. we are in, it is impossible for us to get out because we lost it on the, on the issue of energy. Have uh, we lost it? Oh, completely. If we've shut down four refineries, yeah, and there is no talk whatsoever of even reopening any of those uh, refineries, and there's in fact a incentive to shut down even the two that are operating. Mm. You know what is unforgivable? And this I hold against President Cyril Ramaphosa, and I shall do so forever in a day. Mm. And there's a time when he must take responsibility for what he did for this country. So in 2005, we ran out of fuel. Mm. 2006, President Mbeki appointed Advocate Moerani to head the Moerani Commission of Inquiry into liquid fuels. Yeah. It, they produced a report, which then was, uh, you know, gave rise to the Energy Security Master Plan of 2007. Mm. The recommendation of Advocate Marumo Moerani were very simple and very directive to say, right now we are energy insecure but the state has got no means of intervening mm. in the event of any crisis. So we have neoliberalized policies that deal with energy, where we're saying we hope and pray that the private sector out of their benevolence, they will ensure that we've got energy security as a country. So the Moerani Commission of Inquiry correctly came to a decision that the state, they had to be a national oil company of South Africa. Mm. And when it was looked to say, hold on, the vehicle that would best serve that purpose would be Petro SA. Mm. And then work was started. Petro SA at that time was profitable. The first company on this planet mm. to have ever produced synthetic fuels and petrochemicals from gas. Mm. <laughs> and with a patented technology, then it could be a good candidate for being the national oil company of the country. Yeah. And come 2012, uh, there were now uh, increasing, how can I say, attempts to try and, and, and make that a reality. Mm. By 2013, 2014, Petro SA had already spent over 100 million rand on advisors to help it to achieve that status of being a national oil company to control a very significant, more than 25% of the supply of liquid fuels market in the country to make sure that we are energy secure. Mm. The refinery in uh, Mosel Bay, Mosgas, we knew that was coming to the end of its life because the indigenous gas it was receiving, already the reserves were depleted. Yeah. I then had the misfortune, I was minding my own business. I do work outside of the country in the areas of energy. So when it comes to energy, I am not theorizing. Mm, I am the authority. I am one of the people to speak to globally, not yeah. just in South Africa. Just this coming month, I will be in India. There is an Indian government-supported uh, 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 agency whereby every year, mm. and you know, I've been uh, going there the last uh, 14 years, Jeez. every year we bring in subject matter experts in the areas of energy, particularly in terms of fossil fuels from all over the world. Mm. We come to Delhi and we are locked into a room for three solid days Jeez. to come up with what is it that we need to do to ensure energy security because without energy security, we, it's not possible mm. for any economy to be able to grow. And the Indian government implements without question. They don't say, well, who is this guy? Mm. Where is he coming from? Mm. What is They implement, and that's why they are eradicating energy poverty in mm. India. Mm. So because of that work I do there, come 2014, and then I get uh, approached to say, listen, it's not right that you are doing all this work globally, but here in South Africa, you're not doing it, and when your country needs you, I had not served on the board of any state-owned entity mm. for 20 years at that time. Jeez. The last time I'd served on it, you know, I realized that this is a lost cause. Mm. So I'd, I'd forgotten about it. So I was harassed and harangued that I must, you know, consider to go to Petro SA. But one of the reasons was, remember, as a former investment banker, I am the guy who knows how the capital markets work, yeah. how to raise capital for large uh, capital-intensive projects. Mm. For example, I was critical of the 
capital structure for the funding of Midupi and Kosele, I knew in 2008 already that it was a non-starter the way that they were mm. thinking of doing it. And of course, today here we are. Yeah. The power station that should have been commissioned in 2015 is nowhere near being commissioned. In mm. fact, it has to be abandoned. Mm. So because of that, and because of my illustrious career, as a subject matter expert, mm. I knew what needed to be done to get Petro SA to first achieve that status of being a national oil company. And then I also had a vision for Petro SA to be a national champion in the area of liquid fuels, to also be a global champion in the area of gas to liquids. Mm. Because with patented technology, South Africans are not even aware that a company that has got the largest reserves of gas in the world is Total of France. Mm. <laughs> the Russians, of course, they also, we know of their key role in terms of supply. Of or the Qataris, on the, the Bahrainians, even the Saudis, the Mozambique now mm. is a new uh, gas yeah, reserve. The space, yes. Australia, they're developing Chevron Texaco or Chevron, mm. which operated Caltex brand here in South Africa, is building a large LNG terminal they've got some problems but eventually they'll get it right in Australia. So that new area there is an area whereby Petro SA because of this unique position of having patented, patented technology would have become a global champion. No questions asked. Many years earlier, not even today. Oh yes. Yeah. And what would that mean for our country? So that is the vision that I had for Petro SA. Yeah. And at the time I, I went to Petro SA after three months of being turned upside down mm. by the whoever, the pe persons that do vetting, then I got the nod. Mm. But I got the nod at the wrong time. To be what, to play what To role? be the chairman of the board of Petro SA. Yeah. But I got, the timing was not right because at that time, after Petro SA having spent 100 million rand on advisors who delivered zero, <laughs> And of course, I questioned when I got to Petro SA, if we spend 100 million, what did we do with it? What do we have to show where, for it? Where is the evidence? Yeah. I mean, there were a number of things. Let me just say this. When I got to Petro SA, I was a cold front in the middle of summer. I was a party <laughs> pooper. And you were raining on a parade. Yes, unfortunately, <laughs> that's why. But one of the, 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 the areas where I was truly a party pooper mm -hmm. is that Petro SA had already signed a you know an agreement in principle a memorandum mm. with Petronas of Malaysia okay because Petronas of Malaysia had acquired a company called African Energy which then was rebranded Engine mm. okay Engine to this day still has got the largest footprint of service stations in the country mm. That acquisition would have helped us to achieve the objectives of Moirani Commission and have 30% of the liquid fuels market in the country directly in the control of the state mm. yeah. through the national oil company, Petro SA. And so when I looked at it, and then upon my appointment, of course, I made a call to the chair of the board of uh, Petronas as well as the CEO, the group CEO, mm. and agreed that uh, we will... Um, proceed with the transaction. We had the necessary funds where we could pay 10% in escrow account okay. and then spend six to nine months, again, making sure that we go through the regulatory processes. We raise the balance of the capital we needed to be able then to make this acquisition happen for the state. Mm. I mean, I was just... Mm, yes. I was I was a You were a You were a yeah, I was, You were exactly, deployed. Exactly. <laughs> except... There were those that did not like that. What could be the reason? Well, the reason is very simple. And that's why I'm saying that uh, I hold President Sir Ramaphosa directly responsible for what has happened, the tragedy that has happened. Because he then calls a meeting of the so-called uh, Deployment Committee of the ANC on the 24th of uh, November 2014 to then in that take an unlawful action mm. of having me unlawfully removed as the chairman of the board when I had a ticket in hand and I was supposed to travel 
on that Wednesday. It was on a Monday morning. On the Wednesday, I was supposed to fly and sign the agreement in Malaysia for Petro SA to then acquire Engine. Mm. And the company which President Cyril Ramaphosa still has got business interest with is a company called Pembani. I'm not... Uh, mm. Listen. Conspiracy theorist. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking bad about anyone and I'm not defaming anybody. Yeah. These are just the facts. And if they, if they feel uncomfortable, if they are unhappy about it, well, so be it. Mm. I am not interested so to, to whether they get offended by when I'm stating the facts. They know what they have done is very wrong for this country. There's not a single one of them. And more so, what was more egregious was the fact that Pembani, mm. in March 2014, had signed an irrevocable undertaking to sell its 20% shareholding in uh, Engine on the same terms as Petro SA was to buy an mm. uh, mm. engine from Petronas. That is something that sure. should have happened. It should have uh, gone through. And then there's the president directly intervening that, or the then deputy president as the head of uh, government business, because he was the deputy mm. president of the country, mm. but also as the chair of the deployment committee of the ANC, which as much as I am a member of the ANC, I have always held for a long time that the deployment committee is unlawful mm. and it has got no space. There's a way that you need to do it. We can have a debate. I've debated with comrades about that. I'm not interested. Yeah. Because then what happened is that my unlawful removal, of course, I went to court. And all the false accusations that were made about me, of course, I was paraded in national media everywhere mm. else mm. To, to really, uh, I think, you know, cartoon me. But those that were doing so, didn't de some of them were doing it because they were paid, and I've got evidence to that effect. Mm. But others were just doing it because, well, cartooning. Yes. And w when, you, when you look back now, this is what happened. Failure then for us to do that deal. The same transaction, if we were to do it today, the premium will be between 14 and 15 billion rand, not because Engine as a company, its uh, valuation multiples mm. have improved so much by a factor of 14 or 15 billion rand. No, because of uh, exchange rate. Yeah. Because energy assets are valued in dollars. It doesn't matter whatever you come mm, to, you mm. still have to use a dollar as your base valuation. So we will now pay 14 to 15 billion rent more, depending on where the rent is. Had President Sir Ramaphosa, the then deputy president, not taken that unlawful action to remove me when he knew full well that I was actually on the verge of signing that agreement, the this country would have been better off. Yeah. And he has never once, because... I'm not gossiping about him. Well, we of course we are in media, we, <laughs> but I'm not gossiping. About, but I told him yeah. at the union building in 2015, and I told him that. So he knows the truth. Yeah. He knows I'm not, uh, you know, defaming him or anything like that. But he himself, he's going to have to face his own demons. He himself is going to have to come to say that history is the fairest judge of all, mm. and a good conscience is the only sure reward. The question is that will he uh, have a good conscience? Will history judge him based on the work that he did? And when it judges him, what will that court of history, when it sits in judgment, what verdict will it give on him? I'm talking about something where mm -hmm. I can personally, I've got evidential material to be able to sustain the statements that I'm making. I'm not just making some unfounded allegations. But so as a country now, of course, I told them at the time that Petro SA, there was no way it was going to continue to operate. It's mm -hmm. now near bankrupt. It can't even have, the, in fact, they are killing the plant. Is by, it, it's a deliberate act now. It is a deliberate act. Yeah. And uh, the, I think what is going to happen is that I know that the politicians, the grabby, greedy, comprador politicians are now trying to bring Petro SA into the ground so that the patented technology of Petro SA can be given to a foreign multinational for free. Mm. No different from what they did with South African Airways. Yeah. So they are going to take that technology. So the people of this country need to be on the alert. The people of this country need to be made aware of this risk that the patented technology of Petro SA is fallen into wrong hands and is about to be given for free 
to some foreign multinational when that should have been South Africa's crown jewel mm. that we then use in terms of really ensuring that globally we become a force for good as a country. We can contribute mm. to the energy security of the world. So th those are some of the things mm. that, of course, I am, um, you know, I've got personal knowledge about, and I think something should have been done wasn't done. Mm. But at the same time, you know, even after I was uh, cartooned and uh, vilified in the media, I still had love for this country. Of course, I continue to have love for this country. Yeah. In 2015, I put together a team of engineers because the problems of ESCOM, in 2015 we were gripped by rolling blackouts. The usage of diesel was Sky well marketing. over, you know, 12 billion rent a year. That's how serious the situation mm -hmm. was. And, and the three companies that were supplying, two of them, private sector, one was PetroSA, it had no fuel to supply, so the two were supplying. They were making, in 2015, 70 million rent profit every month from okay. supplying diesel to ESCOM. Oh. So you can imagine on why we are back to using diesel, yeah. because it's profitable. Of course. Um, in any in any disaster, somebody wins uh, for uh, much to at the expense of the pe of yeah. the people that they can. So I continue to have. Then I put together engineers because at that time, I even went with the Black Business Council's Energy uh, Subcommittee and the leadership of. Uh, we went to Lituli House, spoke to the then Secretary General Gwete Mantashe, the then Head of Economic Transformation Desk uh, in Okodongwana, and the then. Minister of Energy, uh, Tina Juma Peterson. Mm -hmm. We made a presentation, and in that presentation, we were very detailed. We gave the status of our refineries in South Africa mm -hmm. and why that was a catastrophe that is going to happen. We will be energy insecure. Mm -hmm. You know, if anything happens today, this country does not have three days of fuel reserves to do anything. Sure. That's how serious the situation is. Mm -hmm. But this was in 2015 when I did that presentation. But also on the issues at ESCOM said, yes, you can look at the boilers. We already have an idea of what's wrong with the boilers. Mm. We have an idea of what's happening with the power stations in the hole, what could be wrong. And already at the time, we were unfortunately, I mean, personally then, I already knew that I was correct from day one from having questioned the boiler designs of Midupi and Kosele. Mm -hmm. And it was very evident in 2015 already that there was no way those two power stations would ever be commissioned. Even though, mm -hmm. even the then Minister of Public Enterprise, Lynn Brown, was works lyrical about a unit that has been synchronized. I mean, they just, you know, really, they were at sea, they were lost. Yeah. So then that advice... Of course, was uh, we're just thanked for our for your time, Julia House. For your time, nothing was uh, was taken. No decision, no action was taken after that. Um, what do you attribute that? I'll call it complacency, for lack of a better understanding yeah. of details. What do you attribute all of that to? When 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 I say to you, your house is going to burn in a few days. And these are the reasons for it. And you need to have a house. <laughs> and then I do nothing about it. What are some of the reasons that you, you may have found out over the years? I think that uh, South Africans for quite a long time have uh, been a lot more, uh, have been holding our politicians in good faith, mm. hoping that they will act for what is in the best interest of what they say when they are on a campaign trail. Mm. And of the, the greater good. The, op the opposite is true. Most yeah. of the decisions that they've taken, you know, Midupi and Kosela, for example, was designed for none other than to just as a tool to loot. Mm. And that's why it is the way it is. I mean, I'll give you an example. Okay, Petro, I say, let's forget that. It's gone. Today, it can't even... Can it supply a liter of, of petrol? From what? I mean, <laughs> these guys, they are so grossly incompetent, but at the same time, so corrupt. They are using condensate to try and refine it into... into that liquid. plant was designed, the Fischer-Tropsch technology there is designed to... Yes, of course, you do have a blend of condensate, mm. but your feedstock is natural gas, yeah. which you liquefy. Into, yes. into, into petrol. But now they... 
of course, that's why right now, this hour, they are not even able to come to the assistance of ESCOM. They are themselves now having to import diesel, buy diesel from middlemen, and then the cost are what they are, that are not even affordable. Had they done which I was there to do in 2014, yeah. ESCOM would never have been short of one liter of uh, diesel, but ESCOM also would not have been burning as much diesel. True. That's the reality yeah. of where we are. So th th those are the things that we are dealing with. We will not have been importing the amount of diesel that we, we import now. Um, we will not be energy insecure and we would have been supplying our neighbors as we are accustomed to doing over the many years and the jobs would have been created here. But that that is gone. I mean, petrol say is gone. Mm -hmm. My only hope is that South Africans can come to this realization of the, this, the theft, the robbery that is about to be uh, enacted on them and bring it to a stop, that the patented technology of petrol must stay, South must stay South African, must stay in the hands of a state-owned company. And these greedy, grabby politicians must be stopped at all costs from what they are doing because they are holding meetings in the cover of darkness with foreign multinational CEOs to say what, to try and do a trade for themselves. Mm. I mean, these people sit with the modern day ESO, the case of ESO, where this fool sells his inheritance for a <laughs> bowl of lentil soup. That's why, because when you were talking about this this patent, I'm thinking that's the true inheritance of this country. Absolutely. That we should never be given away at all. Yeah. So let's hope that it can do that. Then Petrosa maybe might have a chance to be able to be a global player because it certainly can be a global player mm. and, and, and it would be a global player. So come to ESCOM now. After this guy said Lutulau didn't do anything, and we had put together a team and said, look, we can assist you. I had a team of people I had assembled. Mm -hmm. We can assist you with uh, ensuring that at least your power plants function uh, without the breakages. Mm -hmm. You can at real time know what is happening. Of course, they rebuffed us. Mm -hmm. uh, 2014, I remember writing, I mean, this is today, you know. I had a news article that a JSE listed coal miner called Exaro yes. was paid 5.8 billion rand in the past year from a take or pay coal supply contract to Midubi. And ESCOM has not been able to take delivery. Wow. This doesn't come as a surprise. In 2014, mm. on the 14th of July, I wrote to the then acting CEO of ESCOM, Colin Majila, and I said, Already at that time, ESCOM had paid 2.8 billion rent to Exaro, but Exaro had not delivered one wheelbarrow of coal to Midubi because Midubi was nowhere near. So it's not even being... Exaro's fault, technically, because uh, Midubi was not they, ready to receive they, the coal. They took advantage of, uh, <laughs> they took advantage of the, 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 I think, I think it is corruption. Why would, if you know the geology of this country, and Exaro has got no uh, uh, no excuse. Mm. They know the geology. They, yes, they are the miners. I, I've had, I've had uh, Uba Bumkocho right there yeah. on the So if you know the he geology. He knows the mining. Yeah, yes. if you know the geology, yeah. why would you insist on having a take or pay coal supply contract where you are delivering coal by a conveyor, when mm. you are having what is called a mine mouth uh, power station mm. because the strategy of having mine mouth power stations was a very good strategy by the Nationalist Party government. What is a mine, mine mouth? Effectively is that you must be able to source your coal no more than six ah, kilometers yes. away. So, so, you, so deliver you, can, it. you can deliver it by conveyor belt. True. Yeah, I get that. So, of course, that is that is what is happening. I mean, the, I think at one time the longest conveyor belt was here in Pumalanga, which was 14 kilometers. That's mm -hmm. what... 14 kilometers. <laughs> Why? Because six kilometers is your cutoff uh. in terms of economics, everything else. But that is to make sure that you can run one of the lowest cost producers of electricity with that strategy. Mm -hmm. So if you know the geology, if the ESCOM people are themselves metallurgists, geologists and engineers and everybody else, why on earth would they then agree to signing a contract of that nature of take or pay mm -hmm. when there is no basis whatsoever, there is, n there is no risk you are saying I'm mitigating in terms of ensuring security of supply of the feedstock, which is coal. Zero. It doesn't exist. Mm. But they went ahead and did that. But even when though it was very patent, clear to them by 2014 that, hey, here, 
we are betting against the casino. Mm. You never win. You if never you bet win. against the casino, the casino always has to win. You get, so the, exactly illusion, the, you get the illusion of victory. but you Exactly. <laughs> they should now have said, let's put a stop to it. I then said to the then acting CEO, Colin Machil, I wrote to him. Mm. And I mean, I'm not saying anything that is in the secret. And I said, look, acting CEO and chair, my, uh, I can do this for you because I've done work in China. Mm. A great, there is, I know most parts of China. I've traveled, I've, I've dealt with most of the state-owned companies. Mm. I know the mines. I've visited the mines. I've dealt with some of their top, top companies. Mm. You know, China Benz uses 4.4 billion tons of coal a year Jeez. to give power Compared to their people. Compared to us? We were mining a few years ago 250 million tons. We are now mining less yeah. because we can't even export what we, we were mine. supposed to be exporting, which is 90 million tons. We are exporting, last year we exported 59 million tons. Even with the Ukraine challenges, we are not even increasing our, our export. We have no rail. Oh, yeah. You know, we <laughs> 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 love this. Transnet you, know, you know, you were in seven. Yeah. He's still there. There yeah. was a time when the world loved him. You were a seven. Mm. President, you were seven. When the world loved him, mm. they invited him to World Economic Forum in Switzerland. Yeah. So he went there, he was on the panel and he was speaking. And he said something that I shall never forget for as long as I live. Mm. Because he was so right. He said, you know, come to Uganda and make investment. Whatever. He said, but you know, Uganda is a first world country and is a third world country. Mm. Because I can talk to a buyer of timber in Germany, on a crystal clear cell phone line, mm. and say, buyer of timber, I am sorry I cannot deliver your timber because the road got washed away. Mm. <laughs> so it doesn't have a road infrastructure. So that's the third world part of it. That is the third world part <laughs> of it. And then, of course, he sent something a lot more humorous to say, you know, when the white man came to Uganda, the you know they expressed to the white men that hey we got a problem here with the Nile crocodiles mm. <laughs> uh, is eating our people and then they said well why don't you eat the crocodile in return mm. so we serve it in our restaurants and everybody <laughs> roared with laughter right. but what he said was fundamental so you have now a transnet that has systematically been killed yeah. that last year the the volumes that of cargo whether it's iron ore manganese uh, coal, mm. uh, petrochemicals, fuels, all the cargo, general cargo, containers, everything else, it is losing tonnages by millions a year. So the last time we exported 59 million tons of coal in this country was in 1996. Sure. Guess what? We achieved that again in 2022 when we used to do about 74 million. We've moved down. What, what made us achieve it all of a sudden? We, we know we dropped. Yes. So it's no, you're saying in 2022 we achieved it. Well, I'm just saying we, we succeeded to fail. Let okay. me put it that way. In 2022, we succeeded to, to fail, fail. Yes. by dropping below 59 million tons of coal wow. because the trains are not running. In, you say, in, Let me go back to a point that, that I raised earlier. You, 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 were, you partly answered it but because I, I want to simplify this conversation in this direction. The problems of South Africa don't seem complicated in principle. It's, no, no, it's, you are right. They are not complicated. Yes, yes. It's, it's a matter of we, we inherited an economy that was strong, that was solid, that had infrastructure. We had a lot of debt, but uh, the infrastructure was, was there. solid. You know, yeah. the bricks and mortar. Yeah. Where the so called investors live? Mm. Bricks and mortar, they can't take. They can't so take we had the, the road. And mortar. Yeah. They can't and take the road. The foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and now, I, I look at conversations that are had by leaders, so to speak, and they say, they say, we need to do that. We need to do that. It's pretty clear when they stand on podiums and they tell people that I will give, will get jobs and I'll solve problems of crime. And, and now we're talking electricity. It sounds like these are simple problems to solve. And then I ask what seemed like an obvious question. Why are we having a challenge in this regard? Why is it that we seem not to be able to break through this challenge of Bana Baja? Go get them food because you have money in your pocket. It's not a complicated concept. You get to a shop, the supply of, of food is there, you buy it and you take it home. But we don't. We seem to have a challenge with either the trip to the shop or the trip from the shop to the, to the house. Mm. Where is our problem? Look, um, bureaucracy is one. Yeah. The 
type of a politician who is self-serving, uh, therefore hell-bent on being, you know, corrupt by all means necessary. Hmm. Um, yeah, most of the decisions are, are really because of nothing but corruption and the the innate desire to steal at all costs and steal everything else. Hmm. That is that is the truth. Unless we accept that this is the frame of mind, the mindset of the politician in South Africa, we will never be able to make progress. We must come to that real. We must wake up from the dream of hoping that the politicians are going to be the solutions or provide solutions to their problems because they are the source and the cause of the problems that we have. Yeah. So that is what I think the realization we need to have. I've given you an example. And I say to ESCOM, I have state-owned companies I work with in China. Let me take this call that Exaro is supposed to give you. You have got an allocation 6 million tons a year at Richards Bay Coal Terminal. Let's use that uh, terminal. Mm. De take delivery, export to the Chinese until your power station is now commissioned and you are able to receive coal so that therefore you don't have the losses. True. It moved from 2.8 billion by, two point, uh, by 2018 I think it was over 11.4 billion. Mm. And uh, today is more than 20 billion that Exaro has been paid by ESCOM without delivering a wheelbarrow. And I'm saying that is nothing but corruption. If you are mm. talking about corruption, that is the heart of corruption. Mm. But also, what is the kind of ethics? What kind of ethical leadership do we say we have in corporate South Africa? That knowing what they know, that you can have a company that was formed on the back of the taxpayer, a company called BHP Billiton, mm. which came from Jenko or Jenmin Jenko. Then it became Brian Gilbertson, externalized it. It still continued to have operations here in South Africa. They changed the name to South 32. They pay 17 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity for their two aluminum smelters. That contract. Mm which was onerous and causing untold financial harm on ESCOM, mm. was extended by a further 10 years in the year 2021. So what did President Cyril Ramaphosa, what did Professor Malika Purumakhova, what did uh, Katima Mulelo Andre Dereta mm. think when they were signing? What did NERSA, whoever was the chair of NERSA at the time, what they really think whereby you can sell electricity for 17 cents when it costs you 42 cents. In some instances, it costs you, you know, 2 rand 28 cents and 4 rand 52 cents. Mm -hmm. And now it has gone up to 8 rand. Because when you're using diesel, it goes di up. diesel is 50 US cents per kilowatt hour. Sure. So wherever the oil price is, Course. is 50 cents. It might drop a little bit as the oil price comes down, but it's still an unaffordable tariff. So why would you charge 17 cents? And why would this company receive? It's not just only Exaro, by the way, that receives money on a take or pay. All of them, mm. they're enjoying, whereby ESCOM is paying for more than 20 million tons of coal, but never receives that coal because they've shut down their units. That is on the one hand. And on the other hand, you know, you've got this other company, Australian company, that is receiving uh, electricity at a fraction of the cost. And we are sitting here, the economy is suffering so much harm when electricity is being given for free. The constitution of this country does not allow that. Mm. But what is what kind of corporate governance is that? So if you talk about these companies that are members of various business uh, organizations, whether it's Business Leadership South Africa, mm -hmm. Business Unity South Africa, or any of those, that can be party to the looting of the state at this extent, because it is nothing but looting. Mm -hmm. well, that, whether they, you know, they protest, they can protest all they want. It is looting. And then have these comprador politicians who, at their behest, insist that a ESCOM must go and be subjected to such onerous contracts. Mm. And over and above that, instead of making the situation better, they go and add on uh, intermittent power. You know the risk when you add on a solar and wind, mm. which has got an energy availability factor of no more than 24%. It's got an efficiency factor of 19%. So you're saying it's not the solution to the problem? Of grid.
yes. not on grid. Anybody who tells you that they can put an intermittent energy source on the grid, that person is not just naive, mm. but that person you are dealing with a very sophisticated thief. That, that is the reality. Anybody who tells you, because they are implying that they can rewrite the laws of physics, mm. right? rewrite... Why have they not been given the Nobel laureate if they have successfully <laughs> rewritten the laws of physics? Yeah. Because you can't transmit on a grid. Off grid, of course, it is a solution. And by the way, we knew by the, by the year 1903, already we knew that the best way to transmit electricity mm. was through alternating current and that when you have a network, there are certain laws of physics that we must follow. So that's why intermittent energy sources, whether wind or solar, mm. have never been a factor, have never been considered. Why would we say that we are considering it today? Except really to loot. And there's a looting, grand scale looting that is happening. So they loot on the take or pay call supply contracts. Yeah. They loot on the diesel that they should not be using. Mm. They loot on the independent power producer renewables uh, on that front. They loot by through maintenance. You know, Andre De Reiter just yesterday was talking to Parliament and he said that we have not been spending money on maintenance. How can a CEO, mm. if he's to be taken serious, make such an absurd statement? Did he justify why they don't maintain? He can't justify it because the audited financial statements of ESCOM tell us a different story that the maintenance for power stations has been an average of uh, 15 billion rand a year. So during Andre De Reiter's tenure, ESCOM spent more than 50 billion rand in maintenance of power stations. Mm. Not the transmission, no. not the distribution, mm -hmm. just the power stations. 50 billion rand was spent on the maintenance. Tell me in good conscience, how can this man go before parliament? And there was not a single soul in that parliamentary committee yesterday who said, hold on, Andre, what are you talking about? Because from your own financials, we can see this maintenance. What kind of a member of parliament do we have that can go to a parliamentary committee so ill prepared and not even have people that are saying, but Hilton, that which that person just stated under oath is wrong. It is wrong. Yeah. Therefore, let us correct it. How come nobody took him to task on that very same issue? How come nobody took him to task on saying, if you say we need more capacity? This What type of capacity? Mm. You can't talk about intermittent capacity because an intermittent energy source brings about grid instability and therefore grid instability has given us load shedding, uh, mm. uh, higher stages of load shedding. If I don't let them both, cost yes, Exactly. Yeah. And if you are adding more of that, mm. how are we going to back it up because we have closed down the coal units? And so it's, it's, you're dealing here with people who are downright incompetent, but most of them, Sophisticated thieves, criminal. We are dealing here with a criminal syndicate that's just wearing a suit and signing contracts that they know full well they will lead to the death of ESCOM, mm -hmm. but they don't care because National Treasury has given all of this. Remember, the 400 billion rand plus debt of ESCOM mm -hmm. is underwritten by National Treasury, which means you and I. Um, we the pay taxpayer. for it, yeah. The independent power producer contracts, all of them, are underwritten by National Treasury. Again, we you and I. So the debt, the debt situation of ESCOM, the true picture, is not 400 billion. Mm. The exposure is 800 billion. Jeez. But they want to add more. The exposure is 800 billion, not 400. Now, Minister Kodongwana, next month in February, when he reads the budget, is going to be telling the nation that Oh, I've got good news for you. I'm going to reduce the debt of ESCOM by probably 200 billion rand so that ESCOM can have a thing called a strong balance sheet. I mean, as a banker, I sit there and I listen to this pool. I say, to these people, I say, <laughs> what are they talking about? Because he, he's not saying I, as Kodongwan, essentially saying we South Africans yes, yes. are going to pay off this debt or at least carry it on our shoulders. Yes, except that, I mean, he's uh, carrying out his uh, work and duties as a minister of finance. Uh -huh. on, 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 on our behalf. Yeah. But the, the drive and the push to renewables is a global push. 
it's not just South Africans that are saying that. The intermittent uh, power, power uh, grid that you speak of seems to be a global push that the Americans are pushing for. The conversation that uh, our current president had with Joe Biden very recently speak to that, that language of let's renew our power source, let's save the planet and so forth. What do you say to those realities that, that South Africa is having? Uh, that even a a, a, uh, a former uh, Exaro a CEO in that on that in that very chair said we have a lot of coal in our, un, under our feet. However, we are told like the rest of the world uh, to stop using coal because it's killing the planet. Downright nonsense. What do you say to that? Well, in the first instance, you know, I told of the work that I do in India. Fifteen years ago, already we knew that we had uh, technologies where we can use coal and have zero emissions, zero. We know that already. We knew that 15 years ago. Uh. So when ESCOM started Midupi and Kosele, the technology already was available for us to be able to produce electricity with zero emissions mm -hmm. from coal. Why have we not done it? So, but when you look at what happened in North America, particularly California and Texas, when you look at what happened in um, throughout Europe, whether the UK, Spain, Portugal, uh, Germany, the green mm, revolution. Yeah, the green revolution. When you look at what happened in Australia, the green revolution, mm. and what happened in South Africa, the common denominator mm. is corruption and looting, stealing of all of this kind, all of these places where they have gone that direction. They all have found out that the price is unaffordable, but the politicians and the the snakes in suits the corporate executives mm. and the lobbyists who went and told these politicians that we must go green we must do all of this and the solution is for you to have wind and solar they knew full well that it is not a solution they knew the laws of physics but their intention was not to give people electricity was just to steal as much as they could and they have stolen whether it is in north america whether they the common denominator that here you are dealing with thieves mm. so it doesn't make it any palatable or acceptable that joe biden can say you need to go this direction, or the British can say you can go this direction. When in fact them, they remain the biggest polluters than anybody else. Mm. The United States, it is the biggest polluter. It is the number two to China mm. in terms of pollution. But the Chinese are doing something in terms of reduction of pollution That's true. by using fossil fuels, but in a responsible manner. Mm. When you look at the Europeans right now, what are they doing? They have spoken you know, left and they have walked right because these are hypocrites, mm. but they know the reality. They know that they can't have energy poverty. They know that they are economists, they can't de-industrialize. But here in South Africa, we've got politicians who are willing, who have got the Ngausa case, where they are willing to kill this country, kill all the cattle, mm. figuratively speaking, mm. and burn all the fields, figuratively speaking by saying to us, we must go to the Dark Ages. You know, the first Dark Ages lasted for 400 years. Hmm. We are now on the verge of the another Dark Ages, in the era of Dark Ages, yeah. based on the policy decisions that have been taken. Now, if anything, if the current president had good advisors who were competent, who were subject matter experts, mm -hmm. people who knew what they were talking about, people who would be able to talk truth to power, they would have told him, Mr. President, when you canceled your holiday to Davos, because those guys, they go there on holiday. All the stories <laughs> that they're telling you, your holiday they, the holiday is just at the, at the expense of the taxpayer. Yeah. But when they should have said to him, now that you've canceled your holiday, we are very sorry. Mm. But do the right thing. Tell the people of this country that you are going to defer the implementation of the so-called Just Energy Transition Plan mm. by at least 10 years so that we can regain the much lost ground. We are on the precipice of a catastrophe. Stage eight load shedding is means a reality. blackout. When the electricity, when there's a total blackout in this country, it will take three weeks to bring the system back online. Yo. Three weeks. But I told you about the crisis we have on the liquid fuel side. Mm. So we don't even have resources in terms of liquid fuels that can last us for a month 
as should have been the case. Hmm. We have got more less than two days of reserves. Sure. We should have. I mean, these guys they sold the coal. Res- I mean, the oil reserves we had. They sold the fuel reserves we had. We have nothing as a country. They uh, pursued neoliberal policies where now the privateers are the ones that will tell us when, whether or not they stopped. You know, the uh, petrol essays entering mm. the correct. You know, it's a rightful role as a national oil company. They did all of that. Now we are at a situation whereby, by their killing of ESCOM, as they are surely going to do, we now have a situation whereby, in the event of an electricity blackout, three weeks later, so imagine what happens from day four, mm. five, six, seven, eight. Mm. Because even military intelligence already highlighted this risk in 2014, mm. that in the event of a total blackout, then in 2014, they gave a report mm-hmm. to the effect that they had no more than seven days, seven to eight days to keep law and order. Mm-hmm. Today, they have no more than four days to uh-huh. keep law and order. So what happens on day five, six, seven, eight? By day 14, what really happens? Mm-hmm. Then here is the risk that I am shocked that there is no one who has come up and said, these are the contingency measures we have in place. In the event of a total blackout of the grid, what are we going to do to make sure that the organized criminal syndicates don't go then and harvest mm. at leisure the dead infrastructure? Because then it, you will never ever bring it back. Because if it happens, yeah. God, God forbid it ever happens that the grid of this country collapses and it is on the verge of collapse, I'm afraid I have to state that, just state the truth. We are in for a catastrophe we have never, ever seen. We have never witnessed anywhere else because of this whole other connected Mm. uh, uh, issues that were never properly addressed, that the leadership we have, the political leadership, never had the vision, never had the capacity, never had the competence and the ability to be able to grasp and then formulate proper measures for us to be able to avoid that uh, that calamity. Mm. Look, I think maybe I'll just say lastly, ESCOM is now looking for a new CEO. CEO of the SA, of, of ESCOM is a, a position that becomes a topical subject. Um, but you, you almost realize during the rates that it maybe doesn't have as much bite as it should. Or it maybe depends on the rates. We didn't see it do much during the rates time. And we, you can even speak of other CEOs prior to that who tried and you wrote very recently in uh, so on social media that maybe it should be a public participation in the appointment of this. What is your thinking of of the CEO of the, of ESCOM? Is it much ado about nothing? Look, the CEO of ESCOM is the most important, uh, you know, executive of any company. Remember this: ESCOM is the single largest company by revenue in this country. Mm-hmm. It's bigger than any other company. Yeah. Um, and because of its importance in the economy as well, you, you can't, it's, it's of interest of every single South Africans, yeah. regardless of their social standing. Of it is of the interest for them to know that the right person is being hired. Because we all need power. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, we have got politicians saying, please vote for me. Why would we not have that person, South Africans at least have some say on whether or not the interviewees the persons that get interviewed for that job who relish to have the opportunity and the privilege of being CEO of ESCOM, why would they not want to have a public scrutiny and a public vote mm, mm. on them? But they must, in their interview process, I think, demonstrate knowledge, skill, expertise, experience in turning around companies that are in financial distress and companies that need a restructuring of the management Mm -hmm. and that's which which is where ESCOM is. So I'm advocating that they must abandon route. I mean, right now, just the, the, the board of ESCOM were happy to tell us that they have, they've gotten some recruitment agents. We don't even know who that recruitment uh, Mm -hmm. or headhunter is. We don't even know what criteria uh, they uh, have 
you know, developed. We don't even know how the interviews are going to be held. Mm -hmm. We don't even know the experience or the knowledge of the person who will, or the panel that will be doing the interviewing. Yeah. But we are told the most important position in this country of the CEO of ESCOM is going to be hired by some guys, even if they say you're a slow learner. How many other CEOs have we hired in the same manner and have completely failed? Mm. So I'm saying this is what we need to do. And South Africans, we must demand that, that we must have a say on who becomes. And we must not patronize South Africans. Most South Africans of all standing understand when a person has a plan and when a person doesn't have a plan. Mm -hmm. So they would be able to really make up their minds that indeed this is the person with the right plan. And what is the right plan? I can tell you now, I am not an applicant mm, mm. for the. Maybe you should, but it's a. Well, I'm not an applicant. Yeah. Well, you know, and there, there are other reasons for that. It's not because I'm. It's just that you know I've got other responsibilities now outside mm -hmm. of the country, because here, it was it has been made impossible for me to work mm. since that Petrosa saga. You know, at the at, mm. at, at the behest of these politicians, but it's fine. You know, I've accepted my fate in that yeah. regard. I'm not an applicant, but I know, and I'm happy to be able to offer my advice. The person that becomes CEO of ESCOM, when they get appointed, they must be appointed after a thorough um, assessment about, as I say, their competence, their knowledge, their experience, their expertise. Mm -hmm. But also they must be able to present a plan, a practicable plan that will and load shading within three months. ESCOM, don't let anybody lie. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what I, 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 I find very amazing, that you can have people that are in government, even as high as the president, lying to South Africans that we can't resolve load shading in, within the in, next two years. Yes, I mean, yes. It's an absurdity. You can resolve load shading in three months, in 90 days. In fact, if you can't resolve it in 90 days, please don't apply. If, you can, if, if any person is considering to apply, they can't resolve it in 90 days, they mustn't apply. If they don't have the gravitas, if they don't have the, 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 you know, the right temperament mm. of a CEO of a company in that regard, please, they must not apply. The person with the right temperament and with the right uh, 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 attributes and, and skills, as I've mentioned, must also have the gravitas to withstand unlawful political interference, mm -hmm. which has been the bane of all state-owned companies. And I know this from experience. I'm not theorizing about it, mm -hmm. that politicians have got the penchant for wanting to interfere in matters they are not no, uh, uh, good at. But also that person must be able to have the confidence of the board. The board must not in any shape or form usurp power and authority from the office of the CEO. Mm -hmm. The current board of ESCOM, newly elected as uh, appointed as it has been, already has got is, is has usurped power mm -hmm. from the executive that is an that is an anomaly in terms of corporate governance you have to ask what kind of corporate governance is this mm -hmm. so we have to go to that that route and once that person presents their plan mm -hmm. they must be assessed on their ab ability and capacity but also on five things that they should implement first and foremost day one you must do the Joe Biden rule. Mm -hmm. You know, Joe Biden got uh, inaugurated, I think, 20th January mm. we, at uh, 11 o'clock. At 12 o'clock or half past 12, he was busy signing executive orders. Mm -hmm. So whoever that gets appointed, when they get into the office, they must already have termination notices of the take or pay coal supply contracts, all of them without yeah. fail. That Ta saves money immediately. Ca cancel them, all of them. Yeah, And then also... Therefore, that will stop ESCOM for, from paying for 20 million tons plus of coal, which they never take delivery of. That is a cost saving, a significant one. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they must terminate all the renewable independent power producer power purchase contracts. All of them, without fail. Cancel all of them. <laughs> that would be a very unpopular decision it's, it's, considering it's, that it's the talk of the town well it's necessary i mean well what do you want do you want a a, a, a 
yeah. ESCOM that is dead or ESCOM that provides electricity. Yeah. And of course, we spoke about in the event of a total collapse of the grid because the architecture of this economy is based on a functional ESCOM, not mm. on a dysfunctional ESCOM or a dead ESCOM. Or an intermittent. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. therefore, that's what we, we have to work on. Cancel all of those. Mm. T every single. Hmm. And take out people like Mandash and them who impose... I was part of a civil society organization that went to court in 2018 to challenge the legality of a minister of energy making a ministerial determination, impose it on ESCOM, which is a, a company that mm -hmm. operates under company law, that they must sign agreements, notwithstanding the harm that they cause to the, you know, su uh, the sustainability of the entity, mm -hmm. but also to be forced to sign agreements that are unconstitutional, specifically Section 217 of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. So the CEO must be able to commit to do those. That's decision number two. Mm -hmm. But that gets taken in the first hour of getting mm -hmm. into office. Yeah. Number three, stop all, stop banning diesel. Yeah. From the so-called IPP OCGTs, Independent Power Producer, Open Cycle Gas Turbine, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm was about three and a half thousand plus megawatts. It's a oh. horror story. At 50 US cents a kilowatt hour. What, what exactly are you trying Very to say? Expensive. When you can't even uh, uh, charge, you know, over what, 12 cents. Uh. You, 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 you sell a kilowatt hour for 12 cents, but you are willing to pay 50 US cents. To produce it. I mean, it's, it's insanity, yeah. to say the least. So you cancel all of that and stop the use of all diesel generators. Horigua and Ankerlech in the Western Cape were never, ever meant to be baseload supply. They were never meant to be backup. They were meant to be picking power hmm. in the event. And then the next thing that you need to do in order to ensure that is to ensure that ESCOM sells electricity directly to the consumer. But most importantly, mm. you know, all the meters of ESCOM in this country are not calibrated according to the requirement and the rules, international rules, and even South African National Standards Authority rules. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the metering of ESCOM is guesswork. Yeah. And, 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 Trust and, me, I'm paying guesswork and I know it, that. Yes. Yeah. So every South African, the meter that they get, mm. the reading that they get, it is not an accurate mm. reflection of the consumption. But what is even worse is to make sure that you kick out all the criminal syndicates. You know, ESCOM they say that they're losing over 23,000 gigawatt hours. That's colossal amount of yeah. money that they call their technical and non-technical losses. Mm. Of How course, do they lose that? Well, that is just electricity that they... It's wasted. Yes, yeah, wasted. Yeah. But a bulk of that, 80% of that, is the renewable independent power producers. Ooh. Because remember this, Every single electron that you put onto the grid from a wind or solar mm. requires 100% backup. South Africa doesn't have gas, okay. so we don't operate gas turbines. Mm. Uh, the Europeans do. So you can't go and stabilize your grid, which is, the, it's got a power mm -hmm. station and then there's a grid. You can't stabilize the grid with uh, um, any other uh, backup mm. other than coal. But you can't ramp up and down True. your your coal boiler. Yes, it has it to might, stay constant. It has to stay constant. Yeah. So you will be operating during the time that the intermittent energy source is not supplying. But even when the intermittent energy source is supplying, you still have to also supply from there. Mm. So you end up with a thing called curtailment, which is you dump. So one hundred percent of all the electricity that any in, in uh, solar or wind power purpose to produce, mm. they know it is never delivered to any customer in this country. And hence I'm saying, what about the ethics? So hence you must cancel it, mm. all those agreements, if you become the CEO. And then on the other hand, you must take the correct decisions. What are the correct decisions? To now return to service 15,000 megawatts of units that they have shut down. Mm. You need to return those to service. Mm. And you return them to service by deploying higher efficiency, lower emissions, clean coal technologies. A circulating fluidized bed boiler, I mean, those are technical terms, but it just means that you have a boiler that has 66% uh, less emissions mm, mm. of sulfur and nitrogen. Is that acceptable rate levels? 
Well, South Africa, in the first instance, does not have a problem of greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. Our global contribution to greenhouse gas emissions is uh, 0.4%. It's almost nothing. Tell me, in, 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 in God's world, why would you go and tell the world that I'm going to save the planet, I'm going to now move and transition to clean energy, when at the end of the day, you are not even a factor, when the countries <laughs> that are the real polluters actually now have increased yeah. their usage of fossil fuels in order to ensure energy security for their people. Mm -hmm. And why would you say, I'm going to save the planet, even though I'm 0.4, it doesn't really matter, but I'm going to save the planet, but I'm going to do so by borrowing $98 billion in the next five years. When you already have got a country that is, I mean, I told you, es ESCOM exposure is yeah. not $400 billion in terms of it's, debt. It's, it's 800 up. Yeah. Because of the guarantees they've had to give to this so-called renewable power producer. So the exposure is $800 billion, all underwritten by National Treasury. And on the other hand, if you now look at the fact that we are not even a factor, Mm. But if you we are solving a, a problem, you, we are not even a part. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And and you would have thought, policymakers, government officials, politicians, ESCOM executives, would understand that, but they don't. Mm -hmm. But I think they don't. Out of is by design that they don't, because their agenda is not to give the people of this country electricity to loot, at whatever cost that they can and. That is the tragedy of this country. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying whoever becomes a CEO must do that, must reduce the number of staff. You know, ESCOM in 2015, we did a study. They had 300 managers at Megawatt Park who were never supposed to have been there, Yo. who are on the payroll but unemployed. <laughs> so They come to work every day. They come to work, yes. but they, they, yeah. there is nothing tangible that you can say that they do. Mm. So when you look now that during Andre Dereta's time, he has spent over 50 billion rand on maintenance of power stations alone. Mm. But we have not gotten one rand of value because energy availability factor during Andre Dereta's tenure has deteriorated to as low as 52%. When during the... Uh, oh, uh, CEO, who was During it? Brian Mulley first time, yes. they were able to achieve 72% energy availability factor. How was he able to achieve? Based on your observation. No, because uh, uh, ESCOM does have the resources to be able to provide electricity in this country. Mm -hmm. During the time of uh, Brian Mulefe, the electricity... And living Coco Mulefe, there was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The demand for electricity in this country was about 34,000 megawatts. Today's 29,000. It's even less. It's even less. Huh. But even with lesser demand... We are worse The off. energy availability factor, which means the plant performance of ESCOM's fleet has also deteriorated. And at the same time, they've had to back up all these so-called renewable 6,000 or so megawatts of renewable power. And they back it up through mm -hmm. now the OCGTs, the so-called IPP OCGTs that are burning diesel to back up mm -hmm. the... I mean, who? I'm, I'm still looking for the business school that teaches this type of bizarre management philosophy. I really am trying to figure out which business school have these people gone to? Because I'm from a business school. I've never been taught any, in, any such mm. absurdity. Mm. <laughs> I, I, I am trained in, in, in being able to analyze companies. I'm trained uh, as a banker. I've got experience yeah. as a banker. I have take, I've, I've got deep experience of capital markets. Mm. So I understand what it is to even project finance, for example. Yeah. And hence, even when they were saying we are going to build Midupi and Kosele, which they should never have been built. Here we are, Midupi and Kosele, I would also, one of the decisions I would take if I was the CEO mm. or whoever becomes CEO must take that decision is to cancel. Forget about Midupi and Kosele because they, require, them down. they require 100 billion rent more. But what is worse is that after you spend an additional 100 billion rent to bring them into commissioning, the intellectual property to that boiler technology, the front end engineering designs of a power station of the type of Midupi and Kosele, mm. that intellectual property does not belong to ESCOM. It belongs to the privateers mm. who will then take the front end engineering design blueprints, who will then take the operating procedures on that boiler, which now would have been fully commissioned and go and sell it to whoever in the world because the world is going to go back to coal. Mm. This so-called renewables is a fad that is going to cool because all the, 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 the people 
are now aware of the fraud that is being perpetuated on them. Mm -hmm. They are therefore going to revolt. So whether you're talking about North America, Europe, everywhere mm -hmm. else, mm -hmm. there's going to be a revolution because they know that renewables are nothing but a fraud and it is is a is a tool for for stealing so there is evidently going to, inevitably there's going to be a revolt so when the world goes back to coal mm. south africa will then have once again given intellectual property for free for having perfected yeah. the use of this ultra super critical boiler of that size which today there's no one in the world who has the exact boiler mm. that is being in those power stations. So they will never be commissioned. But if you do commission them, you need 100 billion. And I'm saying I would take 50 to 54 billion rent, mm. retrofit higher efficiency, lower emissions, clean coal technology on the existing uh, power, stations. power stations of ESCOM, mm. where I've got the flexibility of fuel meaning any combustible material, meaning even a discard coal mm. can go into that boiler. I will move away from pulverized coal because we know the problems where they say some of the coal has got rocks and whatever. Mm. But that is the type of a technology. I will move away from that and have the flexibility of fuel and have the, low, the cost advantage because I'll be using discard material where I don't have to go and mine it afresh. Mm. And I will not be buying it from these greedy uh, profiteers in the terms of the big oil, uh, mining companies. So that's what I would do and return to service the 15,000 megawatts that is mothballed and then ensure that the servicing mm -hmm. of ESCOM boilers is not given to contractors. Because this you contract... You retain that... Oh, absolutely. It must, come, it must come back inside. Yeah. Because that's how ESCOM was designed. That's how ESCOM was uh, structured. Mm -hmm. Bring it back in and then service the boilers, service the power stations, in totality, service the transmission, service and upgrade and ensure that your switch gears, your transformers and your, your substations, everything else is done not by contractors, not by outsiders. I mean, here you've got the management of, of ESCOM together with the board have listened to the so-called NECOM, which is the old war room mm. that <laughs> came back in another guise, to say that they must appoint a company called WSP to do project management for a year. They don't tell us how much, mm. what are the deliverables? How much are they going to pay them? Mm. What are the deliverables to do what? But why do we have a CEO? If we're going to have a CEO have a consultancy. on consultants yeah. Yeah. from outside, what, okay, what authority will they have? Mm. So I would cancel that. Uh, all the consultants, I would kick all the consultants out yeah. and then return back to the basics and then bring back, but also have the competence, the knowledge that you can't be told stories. Mm. You know, they say, oh, we've been given poor quality coal. How can you as a CEO of ESCOM not have a direct line of sight on the type of coal that currently, right now, you should be able to tell on a hourly basis what coal has gone into which boiler, mm. the quality of the coal. So you must know the geophysical and the geochemical properties of the coal that has gone in there. Mm. You must be able to know currently each and every boiler that is in operation, how exactly, what is it performing at? And what is the availability factor that I'm having on that? you got to have a direct line of sight, yeah. real time. You can't be, wait, and you must have the depth of the knowledge. Now, the other thing, therefore, once you've done all of that, those decisions, you'll be able to demonstrate that you can save ESCOM 80 billion rent a year. This brings me to another point. The true cost, all-in cost, of producing electricity in South Africa, transmitting it, distributing it to the customer, mm -hmm. the end user. The all-in cost, including staff, including maintenance, including security, including transportation, offices, whatever, mm -hmm. warehouses mm -hmm. of ESCOM. The all-in cost, including the buying of coal, all-in cost, is 87 cents a kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. So if you were to say, I'm going to be generous and give ESCOM 33% EBITDA margin, earnings before interest tax. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and. Yeah, you know, earnings before depreciation, interest tax, and amortization. EBITDA, they call it. Mm -hmm. Even if I were to give them a 33% EBITDA margin, the consumer in South Africa should be paying no more than one rand 16 cents a kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. 
are we paying now? As per the last audited financial statements of ESCOM for the year ended 31 March 2022, the uh, ESCOM earned 1 rand 71 cents a kilowatt hour. Hmm. With the increase of 18.65% that they've been given, that will... If it goes through. Yeah, okay. Remember that in the current year, they received, I think, 9.25%. Mm. So it means that they will now report that they end 1 run 86 cents. Mm. So from 1 run 86 cents will go to 2 run 21 cents from April 2023. Mm. That's right. But the all in cost is 87 cents. And then the rest will be the margin that then helps them to be able to deal with the issue of debt mm. and mm. maybe re register some profits, have reserves. So you're saying ESCOM, you can. ESCOM can be a power that we're using now can be cheaper even to consumers almost immediately. I would, if I were the CEO, I would make it cheaper. I would charge no more than 116 cents. Huh. Uh, I'm going to cut this part of the video and send it to the presidency yes. and send it to the board. Look at that's That's load shedding. <laughs> it's our backup that just kicked in. So I guess the reality of it continues mm -hmm. even while we're talking about it. Nuclear power, you haven't said anything about it. It's something that the the apartheid government built very strongly uh, during during their time. And, and, and during Zuma's era, it was talk of the town. Uh, it was a conversation that we we're having almost all the time. It quietened almost completely in this regime that we're in now. What do you say to, yeah. uh, to what, that? Uh, what, uh, during the, 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 the tenure of President uh, Jacob Zuma, what he got completely wrong mm. was he appointed the wrong people. Mm -hmm. He had the wrong minister. He had the wrong technical advisors. Remember, the nuclear, so-called nuclear deal was abandoned because the court found that there was no public participation. True. And they failed to communicate the right message. Mm. And it's what it is. They failed to even go to court and be able to, they failed to then follow the process which the court had directed them mm. to follow. Nuclear is the way to go. Quebec... We built it, I think commissioned it in 1983, thereabout. Uh, Quebec now delivers electricity at nine cents South African a mm. kilowatt hour. Wow. It's the lowest cost. Uh, right now, unit two or unit one, one of the units is going for refueling as well as the, um, you know, some upgrade of the, um, um, some of the key parts of that, um, mm. of that station. Um, they'll spend 20 billions, they think, mm -hmm. but it will operate for another 20 years. Um, the cost will be no more than 14 cents, hmm. even after that, yeah. uh, from, from Quebec. So yes, nuclear is the way to go. Uh, some years ago, I did the math to say when there was this controversy about whether or not, you know, mm. the nuclear that President Zuma was thinking about was going to cost a trillion rent, which yeah. wasn't the case. I actually did a, 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 the numbers and demonstrated that the current 6,000 megawatts of renewables, mm. at the end of the 20 years, they will have cost South Africa 1.4 trillion rent, wow. but will have delivered zero in value. Mm. But I also demonstrated that coal... Um, the cost per dispatchable megawatt hour, the capital cost, mm. when you say we're building, the capital cost per dispatchable megawatt hour from renewables is 18,000 um, per kilowatt hour. Mm. Yeah, not megawatt, mm. but per kilowatt hour. Per kilowatt hour dispatchable is about 18,000. That's the capital cost just to mm. build it. Uh, for... Um, Coal is on 5,800. Okay. Um, nuclear was sitting around maybe 8,000. That's the capital cost. Yeah. Nuclear is great, but bear this in mind. Nuclear anywhere in the world has got an ingredient of time. It's a highly regulated energy source. Meaning that? Uh, because you have to have licenses. They, for example, not only should the nuclear regulator in South Africa give you the license, but also the Atomic Energy Agency mm -hmm. in Vienna has to go and give you the mm -hmm. license. And Quebec is not only in terms of the, 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 the Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, uh, but also the Americans also yeah. have. So all those licenses have got an ingredient of time. Before you can break ground, there's a number of years where you have to do the planning. We haven't started. Mm -hmm. So even if the day we start, 
we are 10 years away from producing electricity from a nuclear source. Mm. That's just, we must know that. Yeah. So we must. Not even with what we have already. Because we have. We, we won't be able to. If we, the day we start, we haven't started, remember. Yes. We've made noises. The day we start, we are 10 years away hmm. from producing. So, yeah. hence I'm saying the most practical thing to do today is to go back to the basics. Produce electricity at 36 US cents. I mean, 36 South African cents. Mm. 36 cents per kilowatt hour. You produce electricity from coal. Mm. Cleaner meaning you cut down the current emission levels by two-thirds. Yeah. And you cut down the particulate by 90%, sure. the dust. Yes. You cut it down by 90%, but produce at 36 cents a kilowatt hour. It is for that reason that I'm saying it is possible, it is doable to bring down the electricity tariff from the current uh, hmm. rate to one rand 16 cents a kilowatt hour then this economy will have a chance to grow. Then the people of this country will have disposable income, which in turn they will be able to spend it in this, into this economy mm. and therefore ensure that jobs are created. Right now what we have done, we have killed the geese that lays the golden egg. So that is what we have done with electricity tariffs. That is what, if I were the CEO or whoever takes the CEO, those decisions I'm saying must be taken. Those are imperative. Mm. Failure or, or refusal for anyone to take that or listen to the, pol the clueless politician or even the patently inept board that is currently there will plunge this country into catastrophe because the blackout then is assured. I can tell you that without fear of doubt. The catastrophe that we, we speak of uh, is total darkness. Yes, yes, yes. Is total darkness a possibility Absolutely. in South Africa? It's imminent. It's not even a possibility. It's it's, it's imminent. Yeah, it's imminent. Listen, but it's it's all, equally all, avoidable, obviously. Hundred percent. Yeah. It's avoidable. But at the rate this train is going, it doesn't look like we're going to avoid it. Yeah, I mean, right now the analogy I would give is that uh, we are all passengers in a brakeless bus that is driven by <laughs> the board of ESCOM, the management, the government. And, but we are going towards a cliff. That's a problem. Can we confidently in this conversation say we are probably in our lifetime, you and I, going to experience total darkness this at year. some point? You're saying this year? Yes, yes. Not yes. even in our lifetime? No, this year, this year. What is, what is total darkness in your definition? Nothing works. You nothing at all? Nothing. You can't transact. The banking system is down. The telecommunication system is down. Banking is telecommunication, by the way. Mm. So the telecommunication system is completely down. The water, particulation, of course, is it's... completely gone. Yeah. Fuel, uh, transportation by pipeline is completely gone. Gas, transportation, uh, sewer, mm. treatment and sewer you know, removal completely it's, it stops. Uh, you can't bury, you have to bury the people if they die on that you have day. You bury them immediately. Yes, immediately. Because then there is no backup. There is no fuel. No one can move anywhere. There's no food you can buy. The There's processing no food of food is, is gone. The, the, the farmer hasn't got anything. The, 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 the losses of all the fresh produce that currently is in any one place, within a matter of two days, all of it is gone fraught. Mm. And... You're talking about, uh, you know, the, 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 the meat industry, which is the key source of protein for many people, whether you're talking about chicken, beef, or anything else, everything else. Hospitals. There is no hospital you can go to. There's no health care you can be able to access. Hmm. There is no... Even the president will not have fuel for the helicopter to run anywhere. That's how serious it is. It and, is, And that's imminent. Th that is imminent because, listen, on Sunday, to demonstrate the point, the management... And the board of ESCO made an announcement. <laughs> no, they go and tell them. They say, oh, guys, we take got good news for you. For the next two years, there's going to be load shedding. <laughs> Level one and two. But guess what? Uh. They did not know at that juncture when they were talking that on Monday morning, more units will have tripped at one of the power stations. How can they be caught by surprise when they're the ones that are operating the plant? So when you look at it and you say, but hold on, let's now look at the numbers for what they are. Two more stages of load shedding means it's 2,000 megawatts. Mm. 2,000 megawatts, it means that if we get five units mm. trip. At once. 
Yes. Yeah. Five more units in this hour. That's it. Yeah. Because you no longer can be able, the system operator that people are expressing confidence in, that system operator is actually doing a disservice to the people of this country because that system operator has not been honest and spoken to the politicians and tell them the situation is dire. Sure. What they are doing right now, it causes damage yeah. to the substations, to the circuit breakers, to all the... To the lines that are coming yes. to my home. And then it also gives an opportunity to the organized criminal syndicates. Can you just imagine if you are saying, look, for the next two years, I'm going to period every day, I'm going to be switching off for, for a two minute hours, of two okay. hours, certain sections of the distribution grid. Yeah. So all they have to do is say, look, organize yourself for the next two hours, for the next two years to harvest at leisure. You know how much is copper price now? Over $9,000 a ton. Yo. So where's the cheapest of copper that you can be able to get? It's already so in the ground. If now <laughs> you can have people who don't fully appreciate that, that situation, we are at the brink. Because if management of ESCOM can themselves be caught by surprise by units that trip, how come they didn't know that they were going to be units that tripping mm. when they are the ones that are operating it? Who is at the power station that should have known that, hey, hold on a second here. In terms of my operating parameters, mm. <laughs> I'm running this boiler. is calibrated at 1450. I'm running at 1800. So what exactly do you think is going to happen if you run at 1,800 degrees centigrade for... So you're saying the tripping is not a surprise. It's never a surprise. It can never be a surprise, yeah. except for ESCOM. You can't be caught by surprise because you are the one who's there. You have got the real line of sight. All your equipment mm. shows you, tells you exactly where you are, what is about to happen. But then you've got guys that are sitting at Megawatt Park who sit there and say, well, we didn't know. <laughs> Sorry. The, all they do is to issue statements. Yeah. So, but now the situation has gotten so so worse, so <sighs> bad, that the system operator will not be able to manage and the grid will collapse. But also the risk has been heightened so much that the criminal syndicates are going to go in. There has been no a boost, a bolstering of the criminal in, uh, rather intelligence, intelligence yeah. gathering, around this sector to ensure that we should know who is planning to do what where. You speak of the safety of a grid. Its security is when it's live. Yes. That absolutely. is its true security. Yeah, that's true security. Because the minute it switches off, anyone can do whatever they want to it. You don't need the sophisticated equipment. No. You can cut it with a, with a pair of scissors. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> that's how serious it is. That's, I mean, that's just how simple a live wire is your best security guard. Because nobody can, nobody wants to touch it. You can try. <laughs> you just won't be able to tell the story. That's the thing. Wow, a permanent shutdown is a possibility in, in, in our lifetime and you're saying in this year. No, I've told that you. Is, you know, told, for South Africans, all I'm doing, and I'm saying this with sincerity and seriousness. Because, because no one, no one, while they're having a good time, will imagine the worst time. Yes. Because... Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. And yeah. right now we have lights, we have a microphone that's yeah. on, we have electricity that's yeah. running. It's running through its own yeah. God's help because yeah. we have load yeah. shedding now. So someone is saying, oh, we can have total shutdown, I have solar. We have total shutdown, I have made other plans, I have an inverter and all sorts of solutions that people talk of now. You're saying, well, you won't be able to escape it, even with those solutions. No, you won't be able to escape. Okay, first and foremost, how are you going to get water? Yeah, well. Who will you buy water from? From who? Even if you drill it under the ground, you still have to clean it. Yes, yes. You can try, but you, yeah. If you drill it underground, you're going to have to use solar maybe to pump it or a windmill. Yeah. But how many people have got oh, here in Johannesburg? Gauteng. You know, the biggest population in this country is in Gauteng. Mm. Land mass is small. I've listened to some fancy people, you know, coming up with fancy ideas that, oh, we can do this. We can recover the system first in Gauteng before it gets worse. Mm. But they haven't got a clue what they're talking about. What they're talking that maybe in five, six days we can recover. What do you think is going to happen in five to six days? The day that it collapses, there's panic. Mm. The soldiers, the police, the security, uh, private security industry, 
Mm. They have never sat in a meeting and come up with a contingency plan of in the event of panic because of the great collapse, what do we do? Sure. They don't have a plan. They have never coordinated. So the line of command. Okay, when, when the grid collapses, who now takes charge? Mm. How do we communicate? Those are very basic questions that South Africans need to know correctly so. Mm. But I'm saying the government and ESCOM are not going to give you the answers. So the best way is to pray and hope Yo. that it doesn't get any worse. Yeah. My interest, and it's the interest of every South African, every patriot, I would say, is that ESCOM must survive. And for ESCOM to survive, they must get back to the basics. And ESCOM must stop overcharging us for electricity that they are not able to deliver and invoice us on guesswork. Mm -hmm. But here's what is worse. They sell electricity, prepaid electricity through intermediaries. The intermediaries charge. They earn 14 billion rent a year plus, but they do nothing. They add no value. Wow. These are middlemen, yeah. but they earn 14 billion rent. So they are part of the problem. Yeah. Apart from so you're that, saying remove those and ESCOM must be the one selling it have, directly? Yeah, of course. I'm saying, look, ESCOM is an industry. It's not a sector. It's not even a company. Mm -mm. ESCOM is an industry. Mm -hmm. There should be no basis for ESCOM to now think that it is a company within a sector of yes. an industry. Yeah. It is the industry. ESCOM is the country. Therefore, everything must be done in-house. But you need management that is competent, and you need a board that uh, understands the role of the board. The current board itself doesn't know the role of the board. The role of the board has never been to manage the company. True. It's always been to lead and provide oversight. Mm -hmm. They are now trying to manage. They admit by, their, by themselves that, oh, we are a lot more interventionist. We want to <laughs> be involved. I'm thinking, what kind of a corporate mm, governance is that? Yeah. Which, which which case study can the, we the, refer the, to? The king, king, what? What yeah. king are we on now? Well, <laughs> Doesn't even recognize yes. a board that's this yes. active. So which <laughs> which are we talking about? But yeah. it's counterproductive. And then from there they listen to these clueless politicians through this so-called uh, NICOM, mm. National Electricity Crisis uh, Committee. So that is that is just making matters worse. Yeah. Yeah. But I think let let us hope that what people like myself are calling for, that we must recruit correctly the next CEO of ESCOM and that the next CEO of ESCOM will be able to take the decisions, the five major decisions I've spoken about. Mm -hmm. And those five decisions will then save 80 billion rent a year, mm -hmm. but also bring down the electricity tariff to 116 cents. I've, I've proven that. If the government wants to engage with me on how I arrived at those figures, I am happy to provide them that advice. Yeah. Not that I want to be <laughs> to, in the job to take over because the, the, you know, I've got other commitments elsewhere, yeah. but I'm happy to be able to advise them. 116 cents, that is what we should be paying. But South Africans, we must now, and mm. must, if I were to do a mobilization, would be to mobilize South Africans that we must demand a tariff of one rand sixteen cents. It's not sufficient just to say the tariff is high, mm. but we must say what is the number. The number is one rand sixteen cents, and that will allow ESCOM to be able to have even surplus uh, cash flow to be able to then ensure that going forward mm. it can continue to you know upgrade uh, the infrastructure and bring the demand back up to at least thirty four thousand. Yeah. Midupi and Kusile cancel, they, we will not cancel get... Cancel as in write-off. Yes, yeah, write-off. Write-off is... They are a write-off. Like, we, 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 uh, you know, when, when the insurance company says, your car is a write-off, there's nothing we can do to You've it. You've got it right. Let's okay. move on. And in fact, they themselves admit that they are a write-off. That's why uh, Minister Godongwana next month uh. says he's going to give details of a bailout or the, the, the reduction of ESCOM debt. Uh. The reduction of ESCOM debt is a write-off. Of oh. those two power stations, mm. it starts there. That, that's what it. No, that's what it is. Yeah. He's he's impairing. This is in accounting language is called an impairment charge. Mm. So he's going to impair those two power stations hmm. by at least two hundred billion rand, from what I'm hearing. Yeah. But that is not the all. He will have to also cough up another seventy billion rand hmm. to so. It means that the national treasury is exposed to ESCOM by a factor of 
between 270 and 300 billion rent this year. Sure. That is the seriousness of the situation. So to pretend that we're going to be able to achieve when they require an additional 100 billion rent, those two power stations... Rather where, not. Where rather, gonna, not. Rather, rather not. As I say, spend 50 to 54 billion, bring back 15,000 megawatts mm. into service and make sure that all these other decisions, they can support that and make it possible for us to be energy secure and then be able to then have a selling point to the world that we've got reliable we've got security of supply of electricity yeah. and then invite investors to come and invest in energy intensive industries because energy intensive industries by ordinarily are labor intensive of course, themselves of course. so when they're talking about a data center mm. when they're talking about a um, simple thing yes, even a call center they they are <laughs> energy intensive of course so you have to stay on not all only the, the time. processing you know david the in 2010 yeah a global investment bank or bank city did a valuation of South Africa's natural resources mm -hmm. and came to a valuation number of two and a half trillion dollars. Huh. That is the mineral resources that we know of, that we have mapped mm -hmm. and have uh, you know come up with a indicated, if not measured and proven reserve. Yeah. Two and a half trillion dollars. But once you start processing those marvelous magical things happen mm. but if you have got a correct mindset in terms of macroeconomic policy uh, planning mm. and particularly in terms of your industrial policy uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy you can be able to use that base of 200 two and a half trillion dollars to ensure that you've got a stable currency that is not fluctuating and weakening mm -hmm. and therefore have a chance to be able to have predict predictability mm. because remember a fluctuating weakening currency adds to inflation wars. Inflation adds to interest rates rising. When interest rates rise, then the people who would ordinarily would have invested in mm -hmm. bricks and mortar businesses, they don't because the return will be nominal 10, 12%. Because money so is expensive. Why would I invest where I've got labor and I've got all these problems and I've got all these risks? And I have I can, no power. If I, can get, <laughs> if I can get 9 to 10% by just sitting and doing nothing. So the economy of this country has been financialized yeah. through these various decisions. But this requires that we need to have a government that is humble enough, people in government who are humble enough to know what they don't know, and to be able to know who to ask mm -hmm. for correct advice that is not sugar-coated, where they don't get told what they like, mm -hmm. where they don't get, you know, they're looking for praise singers. We give it to you straight, not because we don't, not because we disrespect you. Mm -hmm. We give it to you straight so that you can understand the agency of the moment and the need to take the correct decisions. So people like myself must not be seen as the cold front in the middle of summer. Mm. We must be seen as people who at the end of the day, like the prophets of old, told the king what needed to be done, yeah. not what the king needed to hear. Also, I'm not talking about King David. But <laughs> yeah, you, 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 get, you get what I'm saying. Completely. Last year, towards the end of last year, you predicted the grid getting worse. Yes, you yes. predicted that... Uh, Per supply will be much, much worse than it was. That was in August or so. It was an interview that you did with SABC, I think. Yes. And your prediction has been proven right. If you were a betting man, you would have made a lot of money. Uh, and now, yeah. what do you say now? We are having this conversation towards the end of Jan in 2023. I'm asking you again to make a prediction. In a way, in this conversation, you've already made that prediction. But I want to hear it directly to that question. What do you predict? We, where, where are we going when it comes to our grid? That's what I'm saying to you. The, 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 the collapse is imminent. Yeah. Um, so what is the government telling ESCOM to do? They are telling them to sign um, the likes of car powership. Mm -hmm. It's a disaster. What is car powership? Is this a uh, ship that has got gas turbines mounted okay. on it and it can produce electricity up to, I mean, I think uh, several thousand. It's a mini power station okay. that is just in the water, but its feedstock is gas. Mm. Gas mm. we don't have. Yes. So why would you go in that direction? At what cost? Mm. Where, where have they bought the gas from? What is going to be the kilowatt hour that they get charged by this company? Mm. But they want to bring it on and they are hell-bent on bringing it on. 
they're going to add more diesel generators. They already announced that last year, July, mm. that they were going to buy, uh, you know, they were going to bring on board more diesel generators from the private sector. Yeah. All of that, remember, is in an attempt to try and stabilize the grid. Not because they want to supply you power, mm -mm. because they want to avert the total collapse of the grid. Their only problem with that is that there's no more money. There's no... The, hmm. You can't milk the cow you have not fed. Yes, You course. can't take more money out of the pockets of South Africans when you have not given them employment, well-paying employment. Mm. So they just don't have the means anymore. So National Treasury cannot continue to borrow at the rate that it is borrowing mm. in order to try and buy this so-called emergency power for the sake of trying to... Mm. They must face the reality. But within ESCOM, I am telling you now, ESCOM has got enough resources, has got enough people. I've spoken, I've interacted with many of the engineers in ESCOM. Mm. These are people that know what to do. They just need leaders. They need leadership. Yeah. If they are properly led by somebody they can respect, somebody who is knowledgeable. I'll give you an example. I, I managed the exploration drilling in Zimbabwe where we did the best drilling in the last 50 years has never been done. Mm -hmm. We discovered 7.4 billion tons of coal uh, or 7.2 and then 1.4 was uh, 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 tons of coal is what is um, mineable yeah. that we could mine. And then we suggested to the or proposed to the Zimbabwean government that of that uh, 1.4 billion tons, we designed a 50,000 barrels a day uh, Coal to liquids. Mm. Coal to liquids, remember? Yes, yeah, we spoke about yeah, We designed that. Huh. Uh, we designed even a method of transportation of the excess coal for export and even creation of a power plant. Mm. So Zimbabwe, if it does not also for their politicians who are inept and clueless, they, they would now have gone ahead. I mean, mm -hmm. we accessed the capital markets in Hong Kong mm. where we started with uh, a listing to raise a billion dollars. Yeah. Um, so the point I'm making, therefore, is that... Um, when you look at all those decisions there, you need South Africa for us to take those correct decisions. Mm. Mm. So people who must have the understanding, the knowledge. But when they get told an absurdity by a line manager or a, a mm. subordinate, you can't be the CEO of ESCOM and not have the competence. You can't, have, you can't be the CEO of ESCOM mm. and when you talk to the bondholders, you talk to South Africans, you talk to investors, you've got a whole army of other people. When you get asked a question, you say, oh, so-and-so, can you answer that? Mm. No CEO of a Fortune 500 company does that. The CEO, right now, the topical company is Twitter. Yes, of course. Do you know who the CFO of Twitter is? We, no, I know the CEO. Do you know who the you know <laughs> chief marketing officer? I know, I know the CEO. But that CEO, he's able to speak about all aspects of the business. That's true. So that's one of the when I'm saying that the person must have the experience, the knowledge, and the expertise, must be able to speak competently about every single aspect of ESCOM and of a power utility. Mm. And I can tell you without shadow of doubt, I can speak competently about every single aspect mm. of a power utility how it's supposed to run, and when it's going wrong, it won't take me days to know that it's going wrong. Yeah. It'll take me minutes to know that a, something anomaly has happened and we must do something to correct it. And know who are the people when you've got uh, people who talk about delivery and deliver nothing, you remove them mm. immediately. Because that is also what I was going to implement at Petro SA, where I spoke about from out of Harvard Business University, mm. uh, I mean business school, the you know two by two okay. matrix, where in an organization you must be able to quickly know because that's how you must manage. You must have people on the top left who are competent, mm. and they deliver on what they say they will deliver, and they are ethical, and they are loyal. Mm. Those people their way in the organization must be up and up. We must identify them quickly, retain them. Yeah. Because that is the survival of the organization. Because people are still the biggest asset of any organization. That's true. Then on the top right, you have got people who maybe might be good, competent, but they might not share the values mm. and the ethics. They might be unethical. 
They might not share the values of the organization. Those people, as much as they might deliver short-term results, you must fire them. Yeah. If somebody tells you that I'm going to burn diesel to produce electricity, you must fire them because that person does not share the values and the principles of this utility called ESCOM. Mm. You fire that person immediately, even though they might be delivering because they might, on a short term, give you kilowatt hours and then the lights are on, mm. but at what cost? You will be out of business in short order of time. That's true. But on the bottom left, you then have got people who are very... They understand the values of the organization. They are ethical. They are loyal. But sometimes they don't get to deliver. Mm. Those people, you give them a second chance because they might be misplaced. You might have made somebody, given them a position and say, look, you are a True. CFO, but this person really, mm. that's not their, their but they are their, they're a good person. You, you give made, them. You, you may have made them. a strike. I go. Yes, exactly. It's a, it's a, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so those persons, you give them. Then on the top, uh, I mean, bottom right, mm. is people who don't share the values of the organizations, don't deliver, they... They are corrupt. They are, they're just, yeah, they're, <laughs> those also, like the top right, you fire mm. without hesitation. And that's how you run the organization. But you must have the competence, you must have the knowledge, you must have the tools to be able to assess your people time-wise. And it does not matter that there is 42,000 people or so that work at ESCOM. Of the 42,000 people that you lead, they must all be able to be able to reach you, to be able to access you, mm. even though you are the CEO. And what I'm saying, by the way, is not an impossibility. Let me give you an example, a real-life example. The late Steve Jobs mm. was so meticulous, paid so much attention to detail, and knew everything about the organization, that he even knew what menu they were saving at the canteen, <laughs> at corporate headquarters, right. no matter how many thousands of people worked there. Mm. That is the level of detail. That's why he could be able to speak because competently about it. That is not only, let's say, limited to him. You go and you talk about Elon Musk. Mm. You talk to Elon Musk about Tesla. He knows exactly what is happening at Tesla, what's happening at SpaceX, what is happening at Solar City, what is happening at Starlink, what is happening at Neuralink. At Twitter now. <laughs> and at Twitter now. Yeah. And he reduced the number of people at Twitter and Twitter is still functioning. Mm. The sky has not fallen. Why? Because there were, num there were so many people on the Twitter payroll who were unemployed. He removed those... Uh, yes, absolutely. ...that you spoke of. Yes. So those are the, that is the level of detail. That is the type of a manager that you require a turnaround artist who has got the gravitas but also that can lead with influence remember leadership is influence no more no less as john c maxwell puts it that if you are a leader and you don't have so i i, I love the way that uh, professor noel tishi who's the founder of the michigan business school in michigan university business school he puts it that there is the social architecture and there's a technical architecture. Mm. If you are the CEO of any company, you have to be good in both the social architecture True. and the technical architecture. The social architecture is the ability to lead by influence because you can't go always go and use a, you know, lead by a threat, intimidation no. and all of that. So you must, people must be able to do that which you want them to do because they want to do. They've been influenced. They understand the role that they are playing and more so the important role that they are playing in this organization, mm -hmm. in this society. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you must have the technical, you must have the technical competence so that the technical architecture of the organization, the moment it is being tempered with, it is being changed, you are also aware you've got your pulse, on, you know, your finger on the pulse yeah. and you can be able to then make the correct judgment calls at the right time. Right now at ESCOM, I'm telling you, there is not a person who can lead ESCOM internally hmm. that can be able to grasp these issues and do them in those manner. But the problem is this. We as a country, we are facing a risk that we are ill-prepared for. We are never meant to prepare for. We are never meant to be in that type of a situation. There is, it is totally unacceptable in this country for very poor households to pay three rent plus a kilowatt hour. It is criminal. Mm, they just can't afford it. No, but why would you charge them that when I'm saying the numbers I can guarantee you, electricity in this country should be no more than one rand 16 cents a kilowatt hour. That's it. Anything above that 
It is the bells and whistles. It is part of the... Profitability of the organization. It's not even profitability of the organization. Anything <laughs> above 116 cents is actually the corruption. Mm, mm. It, it is it's just simply in those terms. So ESCOM is wrong to continue to go to NERSA to ask for, for, for increase of tax. They have no business to go to NERSA. Zero. Yeah. That's why they've never been able to explain their case, except that NERSA is yeah. no longer an independent regulator. That's true. So NERSA cotos. Yeah. It gives the electricity tariffs that they want. Now, this is what happened, by the way. When NERSA continued to koto, and I warned about it, I warned about that in a court action in mm. 2018 with Transform RSA, that this is what was going to happen. Between 2015 and 2022, ESCOM lost 5,000 megawatts of, uh, mm. of uh, demand yeah. that it will have met. Okay. This year, 2023, ESCOM is going to lose 5,000 plus mm. megawatts of demand that should have been met by it. That means bankruptcy. So even with the best will in the world, ESCOM will just not be able to sell electricity at the profitable. The assumption, which mm -hmm. has not been tested, is that ESCOM will earn 318 billion rent for the year, financial year 2020. 24. Yeah. Yeah. Or what is it 22, 23? 23, 24. Yeah. What is that assumption based on? Because they're going to lose. They, Unless the, the assumption is based on overcharging customers. Yeah, but... Because they will not be supplying the power that they claim. But for how long will people, once they know that they are being lied to, that they are being defrauded, yeah. because it is fraud, why would they continue to pay when they are being defrauded? They, there's going to be a revolt. And ESCOM tells you that prepare for the next two years, 24 months, mm. prepare for every day of load shedding you can plan your life better. So when you're planning your life better in that way, but they never told you in rents and cents, mm. what does that every day of load shedding, permanent state of load shedding, what does it translate into in terms of revenue losses? Therefore, how can you still in good conscience say, I'm going to be in a permanent state of load shedding, but I'm going to earn 318 uh, billion yeah. rent on the premise that I will have sold 193,000 gigawatt hours of power. How would you have done that? Or if you include the exports mm. that you're not going to achieve, so I would have sold 205,000 gigawatt hours of power. How would you do that when you are telling everybody that, you know, if you are at stage four of load sharing, the revenue loss currently mm. is 7.5 million rent per hour. Sure. When you are in stage six, is 11.1 .1 million rent per hour that mm. ESCOM loses in revenue. Mm. So in a day, at stage six, the loss is over 200 million for that day. Yeah. So the number of days, that all of that adds up. So what is the assumption based on based that you will still earn uh, 318 billion as though you never, you, you still supply the same electricity you supplied two years earlier? What is that based on? So what happened is that South Africans have been defrauded. And once South Africans are aware, I don't believe that they will just take it lying down mm -hmm. because they will demand an accurate billing, which is their constitutional right. That's true. And when they demand the accurate billing, the wheels are going to fall off mm -hmm. because they will not be able to get an accurate billing because ESCOM is not prepared to be able to calibrate as required by law every single meter that is installed in this country and ensure that it's got accuracy. They don't even have a plan, let alone mm -hmm. the capacity, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, manpower to be able, or in terms of personnel, mm. I should be politically correct, right? <laughs> it's okay. In terms of personnel. There was a time when men was called yeah, yeah. manpower. Labor so in terms of personnel, yes. they don't have enough resources to be able to make sure that every single meter is calibrated. correctly calibrated yeah. to ensure accurate billing, but that also is real time and that you don't have stealing. And then to ensure that they can roll out power. You know, yeah. I know they say, oh, people steal power in the squatter camps in and the, all that. Not even in the squatter Most people camp. will pay. <laughs> they pay for DSTV. Mm. They pay for their service. If it's cheap, <laughs> if it's affordable, most people will pay it. Yeah, well, why would you charge for something that you didn't deliver? Yes. Why, why would you charge three rent? You know, this is, I'm still, <laughs> why would you charge a prepaid electricity uh, user three, three rent a kilowatt? Can ESCOM please answer us on that? Mm. Three rent a kilowatt hour. How exactly 
can you justify that under our constitution, which has outlawed mm. discrimination? Yeah. Because this is discrimination. Against uh, the, those who can afford. On, on the account yeah. of their poverty. The yeah. reason why they are not on post pay because they are not credit worthy in some instances. But in some other instances, they know that, listen, I want to be responsible. I want to be able to know what I'm using so that I can budget properly uh -huh. because I don't have ample cash. Mm. I can't be hit by surprise with a bill that comes and says you used more electricity than you should have. But then why would you penalize me when I'm going in that route? Mm. That is discrimination which is unlawful because it is unconstitutional. Mm. So here what we have now, the rule of law has been dispensed with. Mm. The worst thing is it's when it is the government that has dispensed with the rule of law, it is when it is the government that violates egregiously your constitutional rights, the right to dignity, and the, the right to not be discriminated. Mm -hmm. Those rights are being, dis are being violated yeah. by this government, which should have known better. Mm. And, and, maybe, and, and I'm thinking about it now, that this is one of the issues that actually we need to take up, to undo through the courts, and demand from the courts to do that which they have taken oath to, to undo the unlawful discrimination, the unconstitutional discrimination of poor people yeah. by charging them three rent a kilowatt hour when the electricity sh they should have been paying at the most one rand 86 cents. And I'm saying even at one rand 86 cents, it is a, 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 a theft on the people of this country. <laughs> uh, it should be one run 16 cents. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is a court, that is a court case that I think uh, maybe I, I, I hope that we can get support. We seem to be on the, on the cusp. Yes. If anything, I guess we've always been, let's be fair to mm. South Africans, we've always been on, a, on, on the precipice of something quite catastrophic like that. We always need someone would all push. I get ready, uh, the, yes. the, the straw that broke yes. the camel's yeah, back. Yeah, absolutely. It's so light, but yet it's the yes. one that broke it because it's been carrying yes. for so long. And, and I think this one qualifies as one of those types. And, and what, do you, what do you, in that regard, what do you predict as a possibility when, when that is taken into account? Because total shutdown is a day that we, we don't even imagine as South Africans. We hope not. Because when it happens, it's going to hit us. If it does happen, it's going to hit us so hard that we won't know how to react to it. And what comes out of that, if you've seen disastrous movies of that nature, you don't want that. Yeah, first and foremost, I mean, we've not run the contingency plans. We've not done a rehearsal. You know, amazing that uh, during <laughs> the Cold War uh, in America, they always did the drills. They were preparing. Yeah, for the, for the nuclear bomb. Yeah. Even nuclear bomb is, uh, or atomic bomb is dropped on the United States mm -hmm. anyway. There was a drill. Hmm. We are not doing a drill. So how can the government be so out of touch and be in so much denial yeah. that we are not preparing the people of this country that this is a drill. When this happens, this is how we, we react. Yes. Hmm. So, but the July unrest rendered Sasria, the insurance company, bankrupt. In fact, July, then by December, there were a number of people at National Treasury who didn't take leave because they were trying, <laughs> scouring for seven billion or so to add on Sasria. to the 25 billion that Sasria had because yeah. the claims, I think, were around maybe 34, 33 billion. So, but that was three days and in Gauteng and- Three days. And, 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 and some, that, Yeah, basically. Yeah. And, and even in Gauteng, very few parts of Gauteng, yeah. Soweto, and even yeah. Southing, it was even in Soweto, it wasn't widespread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're saying if we couldn't prepare for that, yes, yes. the possibility of anything worse is not something we prepare. We, we don't have any of the international reinsurers that have uh, underwritten the risk of a total collapse of the grid and the consequences. So we are here, we are exposed. Sure. As an economy, we will be set back 40 years. That's how serious it is. A black a blackout. We will be set back forty years. We'll have to take this country, go back forty years. Like like uh, COVID, what COVID had effect on Prasa? Yes, yes. Get set it back many yes, years. Yes, yes. You know, because I I know of uh, train stations that completely non-existent yeah, after COVID. Yes.
rail lines. Rail lines, uh, zero gone. rail lines. Overhead traction lines for electricity that have been, that are gone. Even roof, simple yeah, things like yeah, that. Yes. So in three weeks, you'll go back 40 years as, a, as an economy. Now the problem is this, 40 years earlier, we had no more than 30 million people. Mm. We now have got 62. The official. Yeah, official. Official number. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so just imagine what happens now when you go back to, that's, that's how serious the situation is. So instability. Then all of a sudden, it means that the next 20 years. It's the, dark, it's the dark ages. It, it is the dark ages. So my, I think our appeal to the government is that, you know what, let us face the reality of things as they are, not mm -hmm. as we wished they were, or as they used to be, yeah. where they are. We are in serious danger. Mm. This is no, the, 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 we cannot be facetious, we cannot be playful, we cannot be yeah. sloganeering no. about a very serious situation. Or politically competing, yes. or grandstanding. And, and we can't <laughs> you know, make a mockery of the plight of the majority of the people who are suffering the consequences of the decisions that have been made. Mm. So we need a government that must be uh, attuned to the reality of the needs of the people of this country. And even big business, mm. my appeal to even big business, my appeal, there I know that there are others that say, look, we don't care about Johan Rupert, we don't care about mm. uh, Nicky Oppenheimer mm. or his son, Jonathan, we don't care, I care. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of troubled that we are not having a necessary conversation with them. Yeah. Because this, we will all perish as together. fools if to we don't engage them. Together. <laughs> they too are going to perish. True. They might run away from this country, but everything that they have in this country is going to go up in smoke. That's true. That is the reality. They'll lose half of their net worth. Yes. <laughs> yes. So no one is going to come out any better in the event of a total collapse of the grid. That's how serious it is. Yeah. There is no sure. insurer anywhere on this world who can insure Johan Rupert, Nikki Oppenheimer, no. you know, Christo Wiese, and uh, Stephen Kosev, yes. or the banks. Or the there is no, for that. Or Mutepes for that <laughs> matter. Or even Ramaphosas for mm -hmm. that matter. There is not a reinsurer anywhere on this planet that has provided us enough risk cover of what is about to happen. For total that's how, shutdown. That's how serious the situation is. So you will have, of course, the foreign missions, they will be the first ones to leave because they will get protection of our military mm. to leave. Then the rest of us, together with that same military. We are stuck here. There's going to be genocide. Has, has any other country in Africa or elsewhere in the world seen anything similar to this? No, no, they haven't. But what they have seen, I mean, talk about Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria... Yeah. You know, they, I think their first uh, rolling blackouts, what we call load shedding, came in 1983. Mm. Today is 2023. Yeah. They're still at it <laughs> because it is exceedingly profitable. To stay in this, yes, yes. In this uncertain yes. space. The cost of doing business is that much higher. Yeah. And there are people who, the life expectancy in Nigeria is not as good as it's supposed to be. Access to health care is not as good as supposed to be. Mm. The very few that have got something, they are able to access health care overseas. They are able to, uh, uh, you know, protect themselves and mm. have some. But the majority of the people, yeah. when you provide electricity, it is a proven fact that you've got a better quality of life and life expectancy increases. Yeah, it happened in the United States. It happened in Europe. It's happening in China right now. Mm. The moment they were able to use electricity, to then build their economy and uplift 300 million people in the last 25 years. Mm. 300 million Chinese people have been uplifted out of poverty yeah. because of the correct decisions they took on matters of energy. When they realize energy is non-negotiable, mm. we have to be a sovereign country. We're therefore not going to be listening to some European or some American telling us that we must do just energy transition when you're not even... Our, you can't even provide power. Our leaders are so timid that they can't even say, but hey, what are you talking about? My contribution is 0 0.4. Let's talk about you. Mm. What are you doing? Start with you first. Yes. Because it doesn't make... 
any... I, I will make no difference. It makes no difference. <laughs> so let me at least do what is good for my, my people, people and ensure that their life expectancy can improve because of access to healthcare, access to better economic opportunities, access to you know a better quality of living. You sound like Kagame right now. And then we will talk to you later. <laughs> yes. But they, 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 they are so timid. They are saying, oh, please, okay, what do you, what do you want us to do? Mm. Oh, we have made commitments. I mean, you, you can't help but be horrified. Sure. Oh, we have made commitment. You say, but how did you make that commitment? Mm. And here is the issue. On our behalf, it seems. We have not, and maybe this is a second matter we must bring to the courts. These treaties that the politicians sign. Mm. Nuclear was stopped on the basis of lack of public participation uh, as required in terms of the constitution of the country. Mm -hmm. The same should apply with the, even the just energy transition. Yeah. The commitments that we have made, we have to... Let me, you know, the, United, the, the UN system mm. is that once there's a resolution at the UN, then the member states have to go and pass domestic law to give effect. To this Until one. that is done, you can't go and implement that which you have not. Mm. Your people must say it's okay. So, but legislation formulation in South Africa requires public participation. Of course. So as the people then, when you are telling us that we must do just energy transition, whatever, if it's just or unjust, <laughs> but it's an absurdity, it's uh, irrational, it's nonsensical, to mm. say the least, but it comes at such a cost, so you can't even do it. But when you now have to say, yes, I was at COP27, mm. and there are certain uh, undertakings that I've made, but now I need to pass the relevant legislation. You know, they're talking about breaking up of ESCOM, they're talking about just energy transition. They've not repealed the ESCOM Convention Act. No. So already the whole thing is founded in unlawfulness. But you have a government that doesn't even care that the law and the rules must be followed, due process must be followed. That's how serious the situation is. So they should have following the, the, the commitments rather that they made at uh, COP27 or any, you know. Any of those, yes. Then come here and say what legislation is in place to give effect to, to that. And in the event that there is no legislation because there isn't, Let's start. then we need to go and do public participation yeah. and bring South Africans along so that we can then make input and show them that, yes, we are not, the question is not climate change because mm -hmm. it does not apply to us. No. The people who must answer the climate qu change question, currently this is what they are polluting. Let me give you an example. This minute that I'm talking to you mm. and the minute or the hour that various people will be watching our conversation, mm. Germany will be emitting 490 grams per megawatt hour of electricity. 490 grams. Okay, hold that thought. They will be emitting an average of 703 grams per kilowatt hour of electricity from coal. Okay. Poland will be around the same, 720 grams, mm -hmm. because they burn the dirtiest coal as is the Germany, mm. as Germany. The United Kingdom itself will be emitting over 490 grams. They come down a little from gas. Mm. Mm. Because the gas is not a carbon neutral. Mm. So the CO2 emission will be three, you know, 490 grams per kilowatt hour equivalent. Yeah. And 703 in the case of Germany for coal, the carbon emission, CO2 emission. Yes. South Africa from the ESCOM's financial statements, where the measurement has been done by any, you know, a mm. government entity, which is the Department of Environment, is that South Africa is emitting no more than, I think, 318 grams per, of, of CO2, 318 mm. grams of CO2 per kilowatt, hour, per megawatt hour. Why would we then say that we have a problem of CO2 emissions mm. when we are emitting less than half of what the Europeans are emitting, what the Americans are emitting, yeah. what the Chinese are emitting, what the Indians are emitting. How did we get to that point where we say proudly we are the biggest polluter? <laughs> Therefore, we must produce, we must reduce. We are the biggest polluter. Who exactly told us that? Mm. When the numbers, there, there's no numbers that verify that. Let me say, 
Now, if you install the technology I'm talking of mm. and use coal, which is the high efficiency, lower emissions, clean coal technology, and you cut down the emissions before you do carbon sequestration on carbon you know, culture sequestration yeah. and storage, before you even do that, just on that technology alone, you cut the emissions by two thirds, mm. which in turn means that you will bring your emissions to around 100 and maybe 406 grams of CO2. You will be the lowest emitter. You will match France. Mm. France is at about 92, 98 grams yeah. per 90, 92, 98 grams of CO2 per megawatt hour equivalent. You will match France by simply doing what I'm saying must be done at the capital cost of 50 to 54 billion rand, no more. Those numbers are the numbers that I know because I am a practitioner mm. in this sector. I'm not theorizing about them. Are things that I know that are practicable and can be done mm. within budget and within a time. So if we can reduce that, then we don't. We can go to COP 27 or COP 28 or 9, whatever, whatever COP it is, mm. And really, maybe just go there to showcase How the ingenuity yes. of South Africa by ensuring that we've got energy security for our people at the least cost ever possible in an environmentally friendly way. Mm. And that is the basis of what a policy, a responsible energy policy of a nation should be. That is what we should be doing. Mm. So why are we not going that direction? As I say, if we can reduce to 104 to 108 maximum grams of CO2 per megawatt hour, mm. the Germans will continue emitting 703, but we can stay there and we can take the existing fleet, 15,000 megawatts, mm. bring it to that level. Then we'll bring our average from all other power stations that are at 318 or so, bring it much lower, the average. still we will have achieved our climate change mitigation uh, strategies, yeah. but in a responsible manner. And still without, be able to provide power to our people. Yes, be able to provide power to our people and without impoverishing them as we currently are impoverishing them. Those are the things that I am saying. I'm saying them with all sincerity. That I, I, I just wish, whether, you know... Mm. I'm not naive to think that everybody would like me, but I'm saying, mm. you know, you might, you might hate me. Because <laughs> most of the things you say, the, the things I'm saying, yeah. consider them and use them. And I'm not even saying, well, you must uh, attribute them to me or acknowledge that. I'm just pleading, yeah. please do these things, in order to ensure that we can survive as a republic, that we can survive as a sovereign state. Any other way we are unfortunately going to become a sad African Republic. Is there hope? No, I, I, don't, I don't see hope because the elections are uh, 16 months away. Mm -hmm. I don't see hope. So you, you, you're saying an election season may have a negative effect on? The election season maybe gives us uh, the possibility of having sanity to return and prevail. Okay. The madness... Now, uh, in 16 months, there will be no country left. So you're saying, and, 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 and allow me to misunderstand, the election season may be the hope. Yes, yes. In it's this, too far. Yeah. Mm. So the sense of agency doesn't exist. If, the election, if elections were it's six months away, well, maybe too, too close. <laughs> the only way we can have hope is if this government was to have the humility to take to heart the sincere advice that I'm, promo I'm, I'm, I'm providing, mm. make the correct decision in terms of the recruitment process of the next CEO of ESCOM, allow that person to be able to take the decisions that I have outlined. Mm. That's the only way. You know, there's only one way of flying an aircraft. True. And it's, you can't, Mm. can't come up with your own ways. <laughs> there is no way ESCOM in its current state can be saved unless you do 
the five major decisions that I have said. Yeah. There is no way that ESCOM can survive if it does not cut the extra cost of 80 plus billion rent, which will increase. Mm -hmm. It needs to cut that, cut that artificial cost. Yeah. Then ESCOM will survive. If they were to do that, you know, if the president was to stand up and say, I'm deferring just energy transition, I need to have a time of consultation, public consultation with South Africans about this just energy transition. Mm. And until such time I finish that, I am deferring the implementation of just energy transition. And in the meantime, I am uh, empowering the uh, board of ESCOM to recruit uh, the CEO in a transparent uh, manner whereby the public can have input. And then once that person is appointed, we as the government, I'm committing my government mm. to stop henceforth with the unlawful interference in the running of ESCOM. We will get out of the kitchen. And I will also make sure that the board that we appoint does not usurp power from that CEO. Mm -hmm. That that CEO must therefore implement the plan which we would have pre-approved. I'm not saying you give a blank check, mm -mm. but a pre-approved plan. So if that CEO says, this is the plan that I'm going to execute, therefore give me the privilege of being hired. Mm. And we then hire that CEO on the basis of that plan. We have not given a blank check. Yeah. But we, have been, we would have been responsible by knowing upfront what exactly we can expect. Mm. Because you need to have certainty of outcome. If we are hiring a CEO now, as we did with Andre and his predecessors, we had no certainty of outcome. No one three years ago knew that things will be this bad. No one three years ago, apart from a few of us, for example, I'm on record before Andre started the work, I said he's the wrong man for the job, should never have been hired. Mm -hmm. They continue to hire him all the same. And defend and him. And of course, see where he is. And defend him. Yeah, and defend very him. Very strongly. But where's the energy availability factor? Yeah. Where's the debt situation of ESCOM? Where is the, the, everything else that could go wrong has gone wrong as though wrong was the ultimate destination. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying we need to have predictability of outcome. And that can only come from having to pre-approve the plan which the candidates who would want the privilege and honor of being CEO of ESCOM will present. And the best plan, and the best plan should therefore be the one that gets the approval mm. and the uh, of South Africans, and then that that social thing whereby it is it is it is abstract because it's, it's not tangible. You can't grasp it. Mm. That thing called uh, you know the the social um, how can I say the the buy in mm. the trust. As I say, we can bridge the trust deficit. If South Africans feel that they had a role to play. This they would right. then support. It is not sufficient right now what we have been told that please support us over the next two years. All <laughs> we need is your support. <laughs> but we are supporting you to do what exactly? To give you have not no told, power. You have not told us what you're going to do except to tell us that we are going to be without power. But you haven't told us how you're going to mitigate the risk of the mm. uh, infrastructure being plundered, vandalized and stolen and support. during that period. But we must support you. That is a blank check. But mm. that is foolishness. We can't do that. So this, I'm, 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 I know that I'm belaboring this point, but I'm saying it because to try and emphasize the import, the importance of doing what I'm saying should be done. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that we have, we know what to expect so that also they can, the trust deficit can be breached. Is it still a desirable job, this CEO of, SA, of ESCO? Most Are we time. likely to see a lot of candidates saying to Mamin? Yes, yes. I think you'll have quality. If you do what I'm saying must be done yeah. in terms of public interview process and people to have the confidence to be able to present mm. what their plan to is. To the public. What their strategy is. Yeah. Their turnaround strategy. Then you will have only quality candidates. You know, Apply. if we go to Deb and July, mm. we only have thoroughbreds. We can't bring in a donkey or a mule and say we are boosting their self-esteem. Mm -mm. <laughs> If you if you recruit the the next CEO, well, donkey won't even make it to the but gate. But the, the problem is that in this case, donkeys might make it, but yeah. because it's done in the 
behind the curtains, mm. where the recruitment, the interviewing. Let me give you an example. The current board, mm. when it was appointed or they were now now, recently, yes. I'm, I went on record to first state that there is a conflict of interest by two persons there. Mm. Or three persons. I think the, the chairperson is one of the ones. The chairperson and yes. one of the directors. Uh, they have interest in other companies. Yes, <laughs> and uh, the former trade unionists. I said, mm -hmm. those people there should not have been there, number one. But number two, I said, the minister never told us, and, uh, what was the recruitment process of mm. these people? So a guy went. Interviewed them. Mm. And how did they perform in any interview? Yeah. And how do you know that actually we have matched? Because when you've got a board, it's like, these are players. Mm. How do you, who is the coach? Who is now going to make sure that all these persons, these players, they're all going to play in their position mm. for the team to win? Yeah. So what we have now is dysfunctionality. It should not surprise us that we have a board that met 50 times in 120 days. Oh. We have a board that then agreed. And you see that number proudly. Yeah. They, uh, I'm embarrassed by that number. I'm also embarrassed. At too many meetings you know, for when, a board. When I, when I had the misfortune of being appointed chairman of Petro SA, <laughs> one of the things I found out that we had directors there that were earning about one in 2014, 1.4 million a year for that's being a board a, member. Wow, that's a lot of money. So I go there and I ask him, how many times do you guys meeting? So the question I asked, I said, but what are you doing here? Mm, you, you're, you're, you're not are, an executive. You're managing, you're, yes. This has to come to an end. And that obviously was unpopular. I said, well, that's it. We can have people who now see this as employment. Yes. And board members it are has to employed. Come to we, we must appoint the right competent executives to be able to lead this company where it needs to be led. And unfortunately, that was unpopular. And I'm saying the same thing about ESCOM. They must meetings. get out of the kitchen. They must stop meeting as many times. If they don't understand the uh, business of ESCOM, this is no time for induction. This is mm. no time for learning on the job. Mm -mm. They should never have access. They should have had, when they were asked to be members of the board of ESCOM, they should have said with all sincerity and humility, I cannot serve. There are many positions, by the way, mm. I have declined. Because I know it's not my area of expertise. I know that I would not be able to add value. Mm. How come these persons, they did not have just that sincerity of knowing what they don't know? Mm. Now they are sitting on the board. Now they are causing confusion. Mm. They even take unlawful instruction from an animal called NECOM mm. without saying, but hold on a second. Fiduciary duty is with us as directors in terms of company That's law. Yes. It is not with, I can't go in court when there's a, course of action to declare me mm. a delinquent director mm. Mm. and say, oh, but sorry, the president said the following. Mm. It doesn't hold in court. It's mm. not defense. Because also remember, ignorance of the law excuses no one. So mm. you can't plead and say, I there, didn't know. There was a guy and, you know, I'm not making, maybe I should not mention him by name. That guy, there was a commission. He went to the commission. He said, I think judge was my bag or somebody. He said, judge, you know, me, I don't know anything about this, uh, about this company's act thing. What I know is about this area of the business, mm -hmm. which was in the sporting arena. Mm -hmm. The judge said, thank you very much. You made my job easier. From here on, you are declared a delinquent director. You can never serve on the board of any company. Wow. You can't give a defense and say, well, you know. I they, didn't they, know. I didn't know it's not a no, good enough. I didn't really know enough about electricity. I didn't really know about the business of ESCOM. How do you have the chairman of the board, the CEO, and another director of the board signing the annual statement when they got appointed in October? Yeah, three months ago. Yeah, three months ago. Then three months later, they sign an annual statement for, for a period that they were not even, Ooh. 2022. Yeah. They sign it happily. And then they can't pick up from there. The maintenance costs. The biggest problems. They sign it happily without realizing, but hold on a second. I would never have signed that annual statement because I have read it. I've studied it. Mm. There is no way I would have signed it because one of the things it means that this board, currently as we speak, is in dereliction of fiduciary duty and is recklessly trading. Mm. Reckless trading is defined in terms of companies act, whereby as a director, you must be satisfied that over the next six months, you have got enough resources to meet your debts as they become due and payable. Mm -hmm. 
there is not a one anyone on that board who can tell you that they do have that line of sight and can categorically assure you. So one of the things they didn't pick up, for example, is that the announcement by Andre De Reiter that look, we've shut down fifteen thousand units, fifteen thousand megawatts mm. of capacity from coal has been shut down, and they classify to be in permanent breakdown. That the auditor in terms of the international financial reporting standards has got no other choice but to have to impair long-lived assets, which is that 15,000 megawatts. Then it means that the balance sheet of ESCOM is not what we think it is. Changes. Secondly, you would know that you can't say the municipalities owe us over 44 billion rent, mm. as they have stated. Because then you would know, say, hold on a second, let me go and do age analysis and say, what is the international audit standard mm. for that particular age analysis. It means that this current financial year ending March 2023, ESCOM is going to have to impair not only the 15,000 megawatts of long-lived assets in terms of the plant that they've shut down, mm -hmm. they will also have to impair 35.4 billion rand of the ESCOM debt mm. from the municipalities. Mm. Mm. It has to be impaired. Whether they do recover it at some day in what, whatever means. Highly unlikely. But it has to be impaired because those are the rules. So that investors, the bondholders, they know what can they're have a correct view on yeah. the financial standing and the operational mm. status and the sustainability, the going concern status of the company. So how would you then go when you have not answered any of those questions and happily sign it when you are already admitting mm -hmm. to the fact that you are recklessly trading. Because then the port of call should have been to the shareholder and say, shareholders, we've hit turbulence. Mm. But this turbulence is serious. Therefore, what do we do? Sure. You can't be business as usual, but you have a board that is saying to you, it is business as usual. So that is, that for me, it is the biggest worry that South Africa the manner in which we appoint people to these very, very important positions, mm. if we do not rethink it, is going to end in a catastrophe we've never, ever imagined. Because they are there presiding over the demise of ESCOM right now as we speak. They are taking very wrong decisions that cannot be justified under any uh, management uh, practice anywhere in the world uh, for, 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 for success and survival. Mm. And, and you have to, to wonder. But also at the same time, remember, the risk is the bondholders very soon from now, they are going to sue the state of South Africa in the courts in the United States. Mm. And that day when it comes. It will be just as day, bad as... That day when it comes, we will not be ready. Yo, we can slice this one in a hundred thousand times. It's a tricky one. It's and it shouldn't be. We've un indeed. analyzed that it shouldn't yeah, be. Indeed. It shouldn't be a problem, this. But we have it as a problem. And Dr. Khadima, I, I appreciate the time you've given us. It's been a, a master class <laughs> on the on a subject that's very painful for South Africans. Because as we speak now, we are in load shedding in this office. That means in the area I'm in. I was in Mamelodi two Sundays ago. There's a TV show that we produce on SABC One. Uh, telcom Monate Vibes. It's a co live concert. They play on SBC One on Sunday at 6. Uh, I I managed to watch it at my mother's house in Mamelodi. It's to my TV at 6. We are ready to watch it. Uh, and then Mabonatima. That means the entire Mamelodi did not watch that show. Yes. Unless they have solutions. And most, mm. very, it's 1%. Uh, that means uh, when we measured for performance of a TV show, we measured on numbers. So the meter. That means those numbers did not register. Yes. And the performance of the show now is considered poor. And I'm talking about one township. I don't know how many other townships were hit by, by blackouts at that time at mm. 6 o'clock. So the effect on my business is direct. And I know that for a fact. And, I, and there's many other businesses. Yes. We spoke about them in so many different mm. details. They're starting to come out more and more and more now in mm. the newspapers mm. about chickens that are yes. being killed because mm. of that. Uh, there's a lady who, who said, who's a farmer as well, who said she, there's a stock, the stock in processing the food. She cannot yes. process yes. the food. Yes. So as a result, she has 
has to waste quite mm. a lot and give away and so forth. So there's a lot of losses when it comes to businesses. When businesses lose employment, unemployment gets worse. Yes. And and the social effects of that yes. is something that can be mm. spoken about for years to come. So I say to you, I wish you would apply for the job. <laughs> but even if you don't, what you've given here is advice. Hopefully somebody will watch it who's going for the interview. And because we we need real solutions to ESCOM. I curse the day we have we have total shutdown. May the Lord bless us from that. We pray. May it may not mm. happen. Yes. Because once it does, we, mm. we are going to live un, under very different circumstances mm. to the ones we have. Afri the rest of Africa look at South Africa as a as paradise. Yes, yes. We live here, we mm. know it's not. Mm. And should it be complete shutdown, the reality of, of what's happening in other ca African countries will be upon us here. And we say, may that day no, never happen. What are your concluding words? We remain prisoners of hope, Eish. even in a state of hopelessness. You are one of us in this regard. Yes. Yeah. So we, we can only hope and pray that, uh, you know, and regardless of the, 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 the the state of the religious belief that the viewers mm, mm, of, mm. Uh, of this, this conversation, show. Yes. this show yes. have. Um, um, what the example I'm about to give is um, not to try and just mm. maybe you can understand that I make decisions from a particular premise. True. You know, one of the, 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 the politicians I've been accused of being a disciple of is John F. Kennedy. Mm. And John F. Kennedy you know, was indeed a Christian. So he didn't have the difficulty of being, a, but he was not saying he's imposing his religious views and as a Christian on others, but he was saying, understand my frame of reference in terms of decision-making is informed by this belief system. Yeah. So the example that I'm about to give is also from that point of view that I'm not saying to people, look, you know, believe what I believe is right. I'm just saying my worldview uh, is premised on this. Uh, it's, it's a statement that says this is where I'm coming from. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, and and um, so I I believe that the the people of this country are created by an Almighty God. That even when there are forces of evil that would uh, capture the minds of the leaders, you know, demonic spirits, if I can put it that way, but that we have a God who is loving and who cares, that because we have been shown the results of a total collapse of the grid, and we can clearly see that that is the picture we want to avoid at all cost. I believe that the, the God who loves us will hopefully get us to that point where we can have leaders who will develop a conscience, who will recover and start to act in the best interest of God's people. Before they are people of South Africa, but they are God's people. That's my view. Mm that we will have a people who will do that. And uh, I, I would say that, because this I believe in deeply, it was contained in the inaugural speech of John F. Kennedy. And it's, a, it, it's something that I live by because I believe it's true. Mm. I believe it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So the words that were inserted there by John F. Kennedy's speech writers is what I think most people can identify with is, particularly those that are in leadership. He said, therefore, with a good conscience, our only sure reward, and history the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking for his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. So what I'm saying in a sense, I'm saying, as much as I have other commitments of international nature, global mm. nature, um, which then, you know, rule me out from being a candidate, mm. 
but I love this land because this is where God determined that I be born and I be, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, I can work anywhere in the world, actually. But I guess in my case, you know, my family is not just my wife and children because I'm an African. Mm-hmm. And from so, you know, from the royal, uh, I then understand that I'm more responsible for many more other people from, from the royal household. So therefore, I understand that, that as much as maybe, yes, I could have, um, you know, the world, the world is out there where I can work. But a good conscience is the only sure reward. And for me to have a good conscience is to know that I did my best for my country that I love, for my people. But I did not do that with a sense of pomposity and arrogance. Mm-hmm. But that I understand with humility the gifts that I've been entrusted with by the Almighty God, that the knowledge that he has given me, the expertise, the experiences that he has allowed me to go through in life, mm-hmm. the, the places he has allowed me, the, the organization he allows me to preside over was perhaps to prepare for a time such as this where maybe that knowledge, that experience, that expertise can be. So I regard it as a, as a duty and as a, 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 a blessing that maybe in this corner of the vineyard, in terms of energy matters, that's where God wants me to be. There are many other places in the vineyard called South Africa. But perhaps in this corner of the vineyard, that's where God wants me to be. And he said to me, son, will you go and work in the vineyard today? And maybe that's how I'm approaching it. Mm-hmm. And, and so as much as I have painted a picture of really difficult times ahead, which is done so truthfully, mm-hmm. sincerely, but at the same time, I don't want us to lose hope. I want us to be a people that perhaps can say, if we understand who we are and whose we are, that we are the children of a living God, that therefore he desires of us to have a quality of life that will bring glory and honor to his name. And whatever belief system we might have, I think that we can identify with that that indeed there is God who is very much interested and therefore will hold the winds, Mm -hmm. you know, the winds of destruction, that we have a God who will hold the winds, that this calamitous situation will not befall us. How he would do it, I don't know. But as a believer, I have faith that indeed the living God will hold this calamitous winds because the situation I've described mm. is a time of trouble as yeah. told in the Bible. No one can stand. And because there is no one who can stand that time of trouble, maybe let us pray to a living God that in a short order of time from now, we can have a conversation where you will say, you know what, Seppo Khadima? Mm. You know that conversation we had mm. and we had load shedding? <laughs> you were so wrong. <laughs> None of that happened. Yeah. That, that is the opposite happened. happened. The opposite happened. Yes. Look at where we are now. Yeah. We are energy rich. Because of energy security, mm. people are being employed. People are going to school. You know, healthcare is available to yeah. many people. The food is no longer a problem. Electricity is cheap. E- electricity is cheap. I'm, I, that is, that is genuinely what I desire. It's like a if utopia. You, absolutely. But I pray <laughs> to God that we can be given life mm. to be able to experience that moment when you will say, you know, you painted a very grim picture. Oh, but boy, you were wrong. Mm. Because that day, 
we will say glory to God in the highest. Let me add this. We are even giving Zimbabwe free power. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> they need it. Imagine because they that. are trying to industrialize. Exactly. And if they industrialize... It solves a lot of our problems. It solves a lot of our problems, yeah. uh, most certainly. So that, that is my, my, my sincere, in, in all sincerity, that is my prayer yeah. that we can be at that point where you'll say, you know what, Sepo Khadima, you're wrong. Mm. All you know, is there, well. there are many things I have written about over the years. It pains me when I realize that you were right. I was right. Sure. It gives me no pleasure. No, when I saw, so I'm hoping I have no pleasure in this regard. What, what, what we discussed when today. I saw your interview in SABC, and you are predicting what we are going through. And yes. right now, yes. in January of 2023, yes. I said, "Yeah, this man can't be can't be allowed to be right again." I pray so. Yeah, we can't allow you to be right again. Kere, to 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 all the words you said in the last two minutes or so. Kere, amen. Amen. May it be received by, by the one above. Indeed. Because we Indeed. appreciate it. Tate Khadim, I hope you will be wrong. Thank you very much. <laughs> we actually do we, it. We, th we, we thank God because uh, COVID has ended, so now we can shake hands. We can. You see, a lot of things can be solved. Even COVID is, yes, uh, even COVID is half a thing of the yes, past. Absolutely. Yeah. But we, we certainly wish for better days to come. Thank you very much. It's, yes. been a, it's been a master class. We've been very educational. It's the type that... When I post them, they don't reach high numbers because South Africans, they want light conversations. And that's, that's hopefully we'll get to a point where we understand that these serious ones are probably the most important ones. Yeah. We pray. We'll get there. <laughs> but th thanks for inviting me to King Day Studio. I uh, really enjoyed the time we spent. Yes. And uh, yes, may in posterity, mm. this conversation be one of those that maybe yeah. made a difference in the lives of the people of this country. I certainly, I believe so. I Thank believe you. so. Thank you again. And if I had to conclude, I would say should the opportunity arise, uh, you should consider going to help at Megawatt. Depend, it doesn't matter in what capacity. Should the moment come, uh, consider it positively. I think ultimately as South Africans, we need people who know what they're doing or at least know what which buttons to press. Meritocracy should be the order of the day. It should be. Thank you again. Imagine a situation where you didn't know where to press here. And one of the buttons can make the studio explode. Indeed. You're the wrong person yes. for the job. Absolutely. Thank you again. That was very educational. King King David Studio Podcast.